Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is August 25th, 2020, and this is a video about Vosh. Why am I doing a video about Vosh? Um, well, recently Vosh came out with a video that uh, claimed, using theory, air quotes, that uh, Marx, Engels, Lenin, Mao, presumably Stalin as well, any other leading Marxist-Leninist thinker who is respected by Marxist-Leninists, would, if they were alive today, support the idea that U.S. working-class voters should vote for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. This is beyond ludicrous. It's already been attacked by other left-wing YouTubers, including... Bad Empanada, and Comrade Danky Kang, and Hakeem, and probably some others that I'm not aware of. So why is this 4 a weighing in? Well, I hate Vosh. The guy is walking cringe. And Vosh has 206,000 subscribers. Now, not only would I like to get some of those subscribers over onto S4A by converting them, because we only have a few hundred at this point, only, you know, having done this for a few months. But um, if we're serious about trying to build a socialist communist movement that could actually take power someday in the United States, not just be a counterpower, but actually take power, which the earliest I see that even possibly happening is sometime between 2030 and 20, 2035 with lots of work, then we need to form the basis of a vanguard party. And I personally see a Radlib like Vosh with his 206,000 subscribers, even if only half of those subscribers actually believe his nonsense. That's an impediment because you have a guy out here who's saying that he is a socialist and he is you know, not a liberal and... He represents real class consciousness and how to organize. You have a guy out here poisoning hundred, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in his audience with these absolutely rad lib views and shitting on actual socialists and communists. So I see that as a huge problem. You could say, as I saw a comment on Reddit, um, not the best source of anything, Reddit, but saw a comment on Reddit that the the offline working class doesn't give a shit about any of this. Well, you know, 206,000 people click that subscribe button on Vosh's channel, so I think it matters at this point in time. I do hope that we collectively can discredit Vosh to the point of, you know, pulling at least half of his audience left into actual Marxism, which he is not. I'll get into more of that in a minute, but anyway, so that's my rationale for doing this video. Okay, so for those of you unfamiliar with the video in question, I am not going to be playing any clips from the Vosh video. I'll put a link to the original video in the description, but Vosh is walking cringe. Uh, I mean, his entire approach of just shouting down his audience, which... He does in this video um, in which he is reading theory to own the tankies, air quotes. First of all, how you call yourself a socialist or a Marxist or whatever he calls himself exactly, while having such contempt for Marxist theory is beyond me. But according to Vosh, he read theory specifically to own the tankies on the question of voting for Biden. And if you're not familiar with the term tanky, Pat yourself on the back. <laughs> it's a horrible term um, that means basically someone to the left of social Democrats who they think are authoritarian or something. Oftentimes it's all Marxist Leninist. Sometimes people say it's just the bad Marxist Leninists. Anyway, um, but Vosh, by his own admission, does not make a regular practice of reading Marxist theory. He did so just in this case to try to cherry pick support for voting for Joe Biden and supporting the Democratic Party. And he does a terrible job and everything is out of context and misrepresented. Um, 
I personally think Vosh could tell that this was a bad idea when he put the video up. Um, that's just my reading of, of his uh, behavior and body language. I don't know what he really thinks, but he's got to know he was going to get owned on this. And, and that's really why I'm also helping to contribute to this. So I said I'm not going to do the video. However, Vosh did put a document... Um, <laughs> the official word on all this uh, in the description of his video. So that's what I'm going to be pulling from. I'll put up screenshots from it, and I'm going to go through the document piece by piece, every single piece of it. And so maybe that is what I, doing my very redundant like fourth or fifth video, debunking the Vosh video, uh, maybe that's what I can add to the overall conversation here. So again, for context, um, before we get into this, what do you need to know about where this is coming from? The Democratic Party, which Vosh has come out in support of, and to be super clear, S4A does not support voting for Joe Biden. Um, the Green Party is running in every, I believe every state or like 48 states, something like that. We support voting for them. Uh, they're not a perfect party, but they don't take corporate money. Uh, they're presidential nominee, Howie Hawkins, calls himself an eco-socialist. This is at least a party that socialists can work within, very much unlike the Democratic Party, which takes even, you know, Bernie Sanders type people and, um, you know, says that they're basically Castro, whatever, <laughs> you know, their crazy right wing idea of like what Castro is. Um, the Democratic Party can't you can't work within that party. It's owned lock, stock, and barrel by the 1% through their donation money. They do the bidding of the 1%. And at, at the very best, they use people like Bernie Sanders as a hood ornament while also discrediting him. You know, They use him as a hood ornament to try to attract sheepdog leftists into their party. Um, and leftists in this case, I mean, even to include... Uh, people who support some limited form of capitalism like social democrats, which is welfare capitalism, social, meaning having socialist elements, democracy, meaning to them capitalism. So that's social democracy. They shit on social democrats, um, meaning they are neoliberals. Neo meaning new, liberal meaning uh, unfettered capitalism or, you know, classic liberalism uh, so that's neoliberalism versus social democracy. We as socialists and communists are not in either of those groups. So there is a fight going on in the Democratic Party between neoliberals like Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, Kamala Harris, and social democrats like AOC and Bernie Sanders. Um, we're not in either of those groups. I, I was willing uh, and have promoted um that socialists should join the Bernie Sanders coalition back in January, February, March um, of this year when Bernie was still in the primaries. I think that that was a coalition that socialists and communists could work within were Bernie somehow to, you know, get to the actual levers of power in the Democratic Party. He, of course, failed or rather maybe declined to do so. He didn't fight for it. He rolled over for Biden. Done a few videos on that. Don't need to rehash that anymore. But um, this is worth pointing out in part because we're going to get into uh, the discussion of compromise later in this document. Um, communists such as Lenin have promoted the idea of compromise. Well, Bernie Sanders was the compromise, as the slogan goes. Um, they wouldn't even compromise with him. So how are they going to compromise with us when they wouldn't even compromise with the social Democrat? So it's just it, it's off the table. Um, it, it's a ridiculous thing to to still think you can work within the Democratic Party. Um, just th there, there's <laughs> there's just so many issues here. But anyway, uh, what I wanted to say about this is that the Democratic Party being the stronghold of neoliberalism that it is being anti-social democracy as it is. But also not being able to beat the Republican Party consistently as it is. Sorry for the trucks and buses going by. I live on a busy street. Um, 
they're not able to beat the Republicans consistently. So they're in this practice of putting up horrible candidates and then just trying to browbeat the left, meaning social Democrats and everyone to the left of their neoliberal faction, which is distinguished from the Republicans almost solely in that they are not openly uh, as anti-abortion, as white supremacist, etc. Trump is taking the Republican Party into an openly Nazi white nationalist direction using open white nationalist rhetoric. The Democrats do some of this, but more softly. Um, Really, though, in the end, no matter who's in power, the same agenda gets rubber stamped. Um, The Democrats arguably do it more competently, whatever. But the point is that they put up these super unpopular bourgeois uh, interest laden agendas that the working class doesn't want. And the Democrats historically had a working class base, which they have now all but lost. Half the country doesn't vote. You know, and of course, those are proletarian working class people, by and large. Um, They don't vote and they don't vote for Democrats. So do the Democrats try to take more popular positions? Do they try to compromise? Do they take, for example, Bernie Sanders overwhelmingly popular reform ideas? No, no, they completely shit on it. But then they try to browbeat you. And we have seen examples of this because they know they need some amount of left vote if they're ever going to beat the Republicans. Um, But they just try to browbeat you. So they've done this using Chomsky. I have a video up on that where Chomsky tried to make this awful metaphor um, to the situation in Germany uh, just prior to the rise of the Nazis in which the Social Democrats and the Communists refused to work together. Chomsky was trying to make the parallel that, you know, I guess the neoliberal wing of the Democrats, the corporate wing of the Democrats is the Social Democrats and that the Bernie wing is the communists. No, no, no. That's all shifted over to the right a notch. S4A is a socialist communist outlet that was willing to work with Bernie Sanders, the social Democrat, in you know Chomsky's metaphor there. But what Chomsky is trying to say is that this is the same situation because social Democrats won't work with neoliberals. Well, no, that's not the same. Uh, they did the exact same thing with uh, Angela Davis, Okay, a radical who lives a very comfortable middle class life as a university professor making 80,000 a year now, Um, you know, and I think she said something about voting for Biden, even though it was bad and blah, blah, blah. She has to say that shit or they're going to excommunicate her from all the cocktail parties or whatever the fuck she goes to in that privileged uh, university, you know, lifestyle that she's living in those social circles. Whatever. I mean, I don't listen to that. But, um, you know, many people pointed out, since when do liberals care what Noam Chomsky and Angela Davis have to say, except when it's useful for trying to browbeat leftists? So I mention all this because that's exactly what Vosh is doing, except that Vosh's position in the whole overarching structure and, you know, hierarchy of uh, trying to run cover for neoliberalism. He is stationed in the gamer community that fancies itself leftist or former right wing that has been converted into a liberal or a rad lib or whatever they're, you know, Vosh is calling himself. Um, that's his position. Uh, I don't know how he could be doing what he's doing sincerely, unless he was actually getting handling and encouragement, whatever, I mean, do I know that for a fact? I don't, but it looks to me like he is running cover for the Democrats, you know, in this particular subculture. And it's it's very effective. I mean, he has a lot of subscribers. If you go on to the Vosh video, the comment section is full of people who just, you know, unquestioningly, uncritically eat up what he is saying. And it's it's pretty sad. And I went in there as S4A and I was trying to break up some of the circle jerk that was going on. And it's a, it was a very evidence-free conversation. And I was pointing out that Vosh had misrepresented everything he was saying. And I was getting, you know, people, there was uh, somebody, their screen name was Red Anarchist. And they're supporting voting for Biden. And I'm like, 
Biden literally came out. Re- I'm not pro anarchist, actually, even I think anarchists often wind up being useful idiots for liberalism. But uh, Biden came out recently and was saying that uh, anarchists should be thrown in jail. So you got a guy who's like voting, <laughs> who's who's pimping the candidate who wants to throw him in jail. That's the fucking situation we have going on. All right. So let's get into the document now. Now that I've given you 15 minutes of um, (laughs) of context and 15 minutes of setup. So this is a document called theory slash historical electoralism that Vosh has put up. It's a seven page PDF. I'm going to break it down piece by piece. It looked like 15 people maybe collaborated on this. I'm not sure exactly who those people are it was uh looked like there were a number of users on the google doc link thing that he put up i want to point out first of all just from the name of this theory and historical electoralism electoralism does not mean just voting for democrats electoralism means working within the electoral system okay i want to just make that clear right off the bat because um, that's really key to understand. We'll get into that more, but just saying electoralism means voting for Democrats, not correct. It means voting, period. It means using elections to try to advance class consciousness and working class interests. I would argue that voting for Democrats does not do either of those things for reasons we will discuss. Okay. So the first section of the document is called forward. And then it has a number of uh, subsections. So section A, barring revolutionary action, Biden is a vastly superior candidate to Trump. Okay, that's not a good sentence. Um, Barring revolutionary action, Biden is a vastly superior candidate to Trump. If you want to make the argument that Biden's a better candidate than Trump, you don't have to mention revolutionary action. It, the one does not have anything to do with the other. I think that what they're trying to say here is that um, if there is not a revolution this year, it is better to have Biden than Trump. That's not exactly what that sentence says. And again, I, I don't think that these really are related concepts. But um, because they don't talk about revolutionary action at all here, they're just um, saying that, well, the the supporting points are that uh, Biden is a vastly superior candidate to Trump. So let's look at these. Um, They don't actually have evidence. They just have points. So one, health care reform, two, LGBT rights, three, platforming and support for white supremacists, four, attacks on democracy, Five, unfilled government appointments. Six, Supreme Court justices. Seven, obstructionism. Eight, COVID-19 response. Nine, federal crackdown on protesters. Ten, climate change. Okay, so the claim here is that Biden is a vastly superior candidate to Trump. And in support of that, we have ten terms, phrases, um, not well-developed thoughts, but that apparently Biden is better on these issues. So let's start discussing them piece by piece. This is far from the end of the discussion. This is, in fact, the beginning. But let's go with it. So Biden is a vastly superior candidate to Trump because of, one, health care reform. Okay, it's easy to be superior to Trump on health care. It's, it's easy to be superior to most Republicans on health care because... They literally have no plan whatsoever. Okay. Um, That said, we had a situation where the Democrats, with Joe Biden as vice president, controlled all three branches of government in, uh, you know, 2009 to 2011. And what did they do? They passed a right wing health care plan that has struggled ever since, charges people very high premiums that in many cases aren't worth it to the point that people don't buy it. That's a problem. Trump did remove the personal mandate, which did result in some 
further price difficulties. But the legislation itself was... The ACA, Obamacare, was first proposed by the very right-wing Heritage Foundation as an alternative to single-payer health care in the early 90s, if you were around then, you may remember that the when Bill Clinton came into office, there was a lot of talk of finally getting the health care thing done. Uh, they, of course, didn't. But the right wing, the Republicans, came up with that Heritage Foundation plan that be, eventually became Romney Care, which eventually became Obamacare, as an alternative to having actually good single payer, Canada style, you know, whatever, uh, health care. That would just be free at the point of service, Medicare for all type thing that Bernie Sanders uh, has been proposing. So um, was the ACA a great or even good program? No, it was neither. So there is a thing uh, in healthcare, in insurance, called a death spiral. What does that mean? It means that there is a tendency in not well-regulated um, insurance pools, the pool being the people who are members of an insurance program, more or less, for um, the pool to get concentrated with just sick people who are just using the services, which causes the prices to skyrocket. And basically, there's no balance. And to have a good risk pool... You need healthy people paying in without using the services, and then you need you know sick people. Well, you don't need sick people, but there are going to be sick people using the services, and then you need healthy people in there to pay for them. The death spiral happens when it's just sick people and not healthy people. So you need more or less everyone in the pool because more people are healthy than sick. Okay, well, there's two ways of doing that. One is just include everyone, which would be like Medicare for all. You're in the United States, you're in the pool, you pay in. And when you need it, the care is there. And because there are way more healthy people than sick people, just because that's the way that nature is, um, then the prices will stay reasonably predictable, etc. The other way to get everybody in the pool is to mandate that they get in the pool, whether they want to or not. And you can do that by a number of means. But they chose to go with the personal mandate, which is basically a penalty if you don't get into the pool. So in other words, if you don't willingly buy in, they're going to take your money anyway to subsidize basically the slot that you would have filled if you were in the pool. And that's their way of offsetting the whole death spiral situation of the cost, you know, getting out of control and like just having sick people in the risk pool. Well, they also didn't build in price controls and they did some reforms of the private insurance system that all of the, the, for, the private for-profit insurance system that all of this still revolves around. Like, for example, they got rid of uh, insurance companies being able to deny people for having a pre-existing medical condition that could cost that insurance company some of their profit, etc. They did this in the interest of getting more people in the pool, though, uh, and stabilizing the system, not out of the kindness of their hearts. So what's been happening? Some of the insurance companies have been pulling out. Um, there's some states where there's only one provider of, of the private insurance. Um, you know, I mean, what was your experience with these? Leave it in the comments. Mine is that I got an $8,000 deductible that I had to pay hundreds of dollars a month to have. And all it was was bankruptcy insurance. Is that vastly superior to... I mean... If I got stuck for $8,000, it might as well be like $80,000. Not that I want either, but if you're a working person, you can't afford either. So you have like the really unaffordable and then the just plain very unaffordable. That's not vastly superior. It's a bad system. And this is a point we're going to come back to more than once. The Democrats are blocking real progress. So that is kind of the whole argument here is that we are going to reward the party, the Democrats, who have been systematically anti-socialist, anti-communist since 
kind of forever, especially since World War II and the passing of FDR <clears throat> and when uh, Truman took over. Um, the Democrats have been systematically, they joined in with McCarthyism. In fact, the only time that they really opposed McCarthyism in the 40s and 50s was when more corporate Democrats started getting like swept up as well in the in the hysteria. That was when they objected, but they were perfectly fine with this basic thing of rooting out all the radicals. Okay, World War II is over. We don't need the communists anymore to, you know, fight for uh, our, our regulated capitalism. Let's just throw them under the bus. And the Democrats have been doing that ever since. They're blocking real progress. They're propping up capitalism. They're propping up a system that is bankrupting, exploiting, and killing you. So healthcare reform. If you go to JoeBiden.com, what is Joe Biden's plan? Joe Biden, on his website, is advocating for a public option. Have you ever heard Joe Biden in a speech advocate for a public option? Me neither. So how sincere do you think that is? In fact, I believe Barack Obama ran on single payer back in 2008. How sincere was that? Not at all. So is Biden vastly superior on health care? His party is the party of Romney care. His party is the party of $8,000 deductibles that you have to pay for rather than just saying no one will ever, you know, just just put a fucking cap on it. Just put a cap even at like $5,000. Your, your medical expenses will never be over $5,000. That would be a good step up. And don't make people pay for it. But they won't even do that. Why? The Democratic Party is owned lock, stock, and barrel by the insurance companies, Big Pharma, the entire medical industrial complex. Vastly superior? No. And let me tell you something else. The ACA is not going away completely. The insurance industry, the medical system as a whole, which is a gigantic employer in the United States, is so heavily invested. They've changed all their systems over to the ACA. Uh, this gets into really technical details of like how hospital billing works and everything, but they're so invested in that system and they're, they're, it's, it's not changing. They're the ones who fucking wrote the ACA. And all this bluster by the right-wing fascist populists, air quote on populists, about we're going to repeal the ACA. They scream it and they scream it and they scream it as red meat for their base. When they get into power, they don't pass it. They can't pass it because the insurance industry wants the ACA. It is not vastly superior at all. This, just, this is just what the industry had decided it wants. It has nothing to do with what people want. It is not a compromise with Medicare for all. It's just what the industry wanted. So as far as Biden representing some compromise on this, it's not true at any level. All right. Moving on, LGBT rights. Yes, Trump is actively hostile to LGBT people. Um, is Biden going to dramatically change the lives of LGBT people? I don't know. I am not LGBT. I am moderately non-gender conforming in some aspects of my life. I am largely, you know, heterosis myself, largely, I say. But um, I don't know. Do you, do you think your life will be vastly different? The right grew dramatically during the Obama-Biden years. Dramatically. Okay. The Tea Party got elected, etc., uh, this is a problem with capitalism. This is a problem with the United States as a whole. If you elect Biden, it will not slow the growth of the right. Okay, I'm going to put that out there as a basic thesis and organizing principle of the entire logic of this. You're not going to stop the growth of the right. Something else has to happen. Obama was in office for eight years and we got Trump anyway because the, the right kept growing. The far right, the crazy right. People who actually do want change, but they're so fucking confused about what that change actually would be. Uh, you know, the, 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 at least the proletarians in there who aren't, you know, attracted to the overt racism per se. Uh, these are people who want change. These are, 
you know, the whole QAnon thing, as batshit as a lot of the stuff is, is organized around this concept that the elites are corrupt and they don't have our best interests at heart. I mean, that's true. <laughs> that is true. Elite pedophile rings exist. That is true. They don't give a fuck about human life. That is true. But then Pizzagate, was it real? No. You know, they come up with this, this kind of crazy stuff like Trump's fighting the deep state. Trump is the deep state. So is Biden. Yeah. Anyway, will your life be dramatically different as an LGBT person? Will, will life as an LGBT person be vastly superior under Biden than Trump? Let me know in the comments. I, I don't think so. Three, platforming and support for white supremacists. Well, the entire U.S. government is a white supremacist organization. Hate to break it to you, but it is. Biden getting in, is he going to root out all of the overt neo-Nazis that are in Customs and Border Patrol, that are in ICE, that are in the correction system at every level, down to the most lowly guard? There was a good article from po ProPublica, uh, I think it was about six months ago, maybe a year ago, that infiltrated a Facebook group of about 10,000, um, you know, border patrol agents and, and other, you know, government law enforcement people. And it was riddled with neo-Nazi stuff, like not one here or there. The people are fucking Nazis, period. That's who's in these positions. Is Biden going to root them out? No, he isn't. Biden is, in fact, running to the right of Trump right now on defunding the police. The U.S. working class has been staging uprisings in cities all across the country, in many blue-controlled states, by the way. And then Biden comes out, puts Kamala Harris as the VP, and then says he wants to fund police to the tune of $300 million more per year, not less. That's Biden's solution. And then, just to top it off, he says that Trump, in fact, wants to defund the police. He's cutting their budgets. He's running to the right of Trump. Now, you could say, well, that's not what this document means. They mean the Charlottesville neo-Nazis. Same, same thing. Yes, Trump came out and said, very fine people, after you unite the right. I literally, my first reaction to that was like, what's the big deal? Like, I, I couldn't understand why people were suddenly taking a stand on that when U.S. presidents have like said shit like that forever. I mean, really, that was my first reaction was like, yeah, and like he's playing to the right. What's surprising about that? Um, you know, many liberal what's different, I think, is many liberals have decided to suddenly take exception with Trump. But it that, that, that wasn't that different to me. Like, of course, he was going to say that was my reaction. So um, would we see dramatically different things from Biden? You would see meaningless platitudes that would be different. Would his funding be different? No, it wouldn't. I mean, do you think that there would be vastly superior, quote, substantial changes in law enforcement and then loosely organized white supremacy. Would, would they crack down on them? I mean, go back. We're not talking about a total hypothetical here. Obama, Biden were in power at this office from 2009 to 2017. Take a look. Did they do it then? Are they going to do it now? You make up your own mind. I don't think so. Four, attacks on democracy. This is a fucking joke. This is a joke. Anybody telling you the United States is a democracy is either a complete idiot or thinks you're a complete idiot. There was a study, the Princeton study. Look it up. The Princeton, just type in Princeton study on democracy that showed there is no statistical correlation between public opinion and public policy, but there is a strong correlation statistically between donor opinion political donor, that is the ruling class, people who can afford to give, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to politicians. There is a strong statistical correlation between donor opinion and public policy. Also, 95 plus percent of the time, the candidate who spends the most money 
wins the election. That means that effectively elections are bought in the United States. There is not democracy. There has not been democracy. The Greens and, you know, to their credit, the libertarians, even though they're crypto fascist, arguably worse than the Democrats or Republicans. Those parties get uh, the presidential nominees get arrested like every election cycle trying to get into the presidential debates. It's a closed system. There's one of the states you have to pay $35,000 to get onto the ballot. It's not a democracy. So, you know, what are they singling out here? Is it the attacks on USPS, which have been going on for a very long time with Trump? Like, what is it? Um, I can tell you that whatever your concerns about the attacks on democracy under Trump that you think are going to be, quote, vastly superior under Biden. No, 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 no. Because the Democrats, we've been playing this game for like 30 years. We've been playing the game of neoliberalism for 40 years. But it's been about 30 years since the Democrats just completely liquidated their um, the liberal wing. I mean, the left liberal wing, social democratic wing of the Democratic Party. Since Bill Clinton, it's been firmly, you know, right wing neoliberal Dems as well. And they really crush, you know, you have like somebody like a Kucinich or... Um, name escapes me the guy that got assessed uh wellstone paul wellstone um you know you have these nominal liberals or like a mike gravel uh left liberals in the party they're treated like complete pariahs you know they're treated again it's like they get the castro treatment um that's been the last 30 years that the democrat right-wing democrats and then the republicans have been trading off power when the Republicans are in power, the Democrats rubber stamp what they do. I saw this. The first time I really started paying attention was somewhat in the Clinton years, but especially in the George W. Bush years, which for people who weren't around, the, the Democrats behaved exactly then towards Bush as they are now with Trump. Everything they said about Trump, they said about Bush. Yet we're here again. The 2004 election, John Kerry, Bush light, people called him, versus Bush. Well, Bush got reelected. I think it's entirely possible Trump's going to get reelected. And not because of what leftists did, but because of average non-political people in the working class. Look at both of these old white privileged guys. And they're like, my life's not going to be any different. They don't appeal to me at all. So, I mean, it's just, it's just so futile and sad seeing the Democrats like trying to do this vote shaming like bashing you over the head to get your vote stuff it's like the illusion is gone the emperor has no clothes it's done so the attacks on democracy that's long gone and i think people realize democrat republican same shit different diaper to use a very tired boomer slogan um I, I mean, honestly, I, I can't think of any more counterpoints to this. Let's move on. Number five, unfilled government appointments. Okay, because we were so happy with what was happening before. Next. Six, Supreme Court justices. If I fucking hear this argument one more time, I'm just going to shit. The Supreme Court. I, I Look at this system. <laughs> Forget the, the Supreme Court. Look at the entire system. The regulatory agencies are full of people from the industries they're supposed to be regulating. Tear it down. Start to finish. Tear it down. You're worried about the Supreme Court? Forget it. It's so far gone at this point. It's so far gone. There is no saving it. There is no saving it. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. So this is, a, this is a, an irrelevant argument. Seven. Uh, because, and in the, the, in the end, they do what the bourgeoisie wants. That's what you need to realize. Republican or Democrat, they do what the bourgeoisie wants. They don't do what you want. It doesn't matter if you vote for them. They don't suddenly get a psychic link to your head. They do what the bourgeoisie wants. My God. All right. 
Uh, seven, obstructionism. Obstructionism. This is like, is this Huffington Post? What is this? So they're complaining about Trump's obstructionism. I mean, go back to Gingrich in the 90s. This has been going on forever. And you think, well, first of all, who obstructed the public option? We were talking about health care before in the uh, early 2010s. Democrats obstructed Medicare for all and even a public option at that time. They didn't have evidence-based leadership. They didn't follow you know, what would be best for people. They did what the insurance industry wanted. And who obstructed that? The Democrats. So I don't even know exactly what they mean by obstructionism because there's no other supporting data to like flesh out the thought. But um, we're, we're anyway, I, I do not accept obstructionism, however that is meant, you know, as making Biden, again, vastly superior to Trump. Eight, COVID-19 response. Okay, the COVID-19 response has been awful. Uh, there, I assert that the USA is carrying out a passive genocide, particularly against people of color who are disproportionately affected by COVID. Okay, in some of the rural states uh, in the north, there is a very low population percentage wise, like single digits of people of color. But there's like a double digit, you know, almost I think in some states, like a majority uh, of the cases of covid are people of color who are not, you know, uh, who are a very small percentage of the overall population. The covid-19 response has been awful. Yes, Trump has actively egged that on. But also, show me Biden being vastly superior. Show me it. Biden, during the debates, shat on Medicare for all as having any relationship with COVID-19. Let's say right now, socialist countries, Vietnam and China, or countries with socialist leadership, Vietnam has had zero COVID deaths as of a couple of weeks ago. This is August. Zero. They're a relatively poor country, but they had the political will and they made it happen. China got their cases under control real fast. The United States is just letting it ride. What do you hear the Democrats saying? They're not saying Medicare for all. They're not saying take care of the people. They're still concerned about the insurance industry first. They're still not saying make the vaccine free. I mean, Bernie Sanders was saying that, but that's there is not a night and day vastly superior situation going on. In fact, I don't hear the Democrats talking about COVID very much. They're quick to say Trump's been awful. Yeah, tell me something I don't know. Water is wet. What are you going to do? But this is this has been the game. Again, I keep going back to 2004. I invested heavily in that election, so I remember it clearly. And I remember going to see Ralph Nader in 2004, and I was kind of annoyed with his um, speech that he gave because he didn't say a thing about what he would do as president. I think just after 2000, you know, he got on this I can't win thing that's, that's neither here nor there. But he, and the whole time he just talked about how bad John Kerry was. And I was like, okay, but, you know, I kind of know that and I wanted to hear what you're going to say. Um, anyway, the Democrats are doing the same thing here is like, well, what are you going to do? I just, I don't hear anything from them. By the way, I'm not trying to bash Ralph Nader. It's just that never works. You can't just say, oh, my opponent is terrible. I am better by default. Vote for me. That does not make you, quote, vastly superior. It just means you can point out the obvious. So that's what's going on there. Nine, federal crackdown on protesters. Again, a lot of that's happening. Well, a lot of the crackdown is happening um, in blue states. Yes, Trump is sending in additional troops or federal police, which is not really a thing, but uh, they're using that term now. Okay. Again, show me that that would be substantially different under Biden. I don't have that evidence. I don't accept the claim. I don't accept it. I do not accept that a Biden White House 
would not do the same fucking thing. Joe Biden, again, is just saying all the anarchists should be arrested, by which they mean, you know, all the protesters who are out in the streets. I, I don't accept it, you know, so I, I don't see the evidence, so I don't accept the claim. 10, climate change. How are they better? Obama entered the U.S. into the Paris Treaty, which was the Paris Agreement, which was uh, said by most of the experts to be like window dressing, lip service, and not substantial enough to do anything. The Democratic Party is in bed with the fossil fuel industry. Nothing will substantially change. Again, show me evidence to the contrary. Don't just list it and ask me to accept it. So those are the 10 points in the forward here that, according to Vosh, make Biden a vastly superior candidate to Trump. Some I have broken down in detail. Some we didn't get past the gate because I just, there's no evidence to even discuss. There's no argument even to discuss with no, you know, bad or no evidence underneath it. Okay, so that's the end of Section 1A. Let's go on to Section 1B. Socialists should participate in bourgeois electoralism if it is beneficial to do so and not refrain, refrain from voting on principle. Okay, I agree. So I, I just don't think that this means voting Democrat. I'm going to vote Green. If I was in California, I'd probably vote PSL, although I might vote Green anyway just to help their national vote count and try to get to 5% to get federal funding. Again, it's about showing your numbers. It's about sending a message, even if you're not winning. Why would I vote for a Democrat? I don't think things are going to be different. And, I, and in fact, it gives the ruling class time to recuperate. Why would I help them do that? Why would I help them perpetuate this illusion that like the Democrats are somehow not as bad as the Republicans? I'll say this outright. Here's one of my premises. Democrats and Republicans are equally bad in different ways. Democrats are slightly better on, on domestic policy. Republicans, as of right now, are slightly better on foreign policy. Trump has not started any major new wars. There's still shit going on in Syria and Yemen that is relatively new. But Obama, you know, Bush started the global war on terror. Crime against humanity doing that. But that was Afghanistan and Iraq. They had a list of countries they wanted to invade, but they kept it to that and i think they really wanted to um attack iran there was a whole thing in 2007 with like a missing nuclear nuclear missile that got stolen from one of the u.s military bases anyway uh i think we almost went to war with iran in 2007 anyway obama gets in you got five new wars five five new wars that was with biden as vice president trump hasn't i mean trump sucks Trump is awful. Trump is loathsome. I am like literally depressed every day that the United States capitalism is so bad that Trump is president. It's super depressing. But that doesn't mean that I think it's going to be better with Biden. I think that that's just going to put a friendlier face on it and confuse people. That's while conditions continue to worsen. So I'm going to vote. You know, I'm a socialist and I, I am going to participate in the bourgeois elections. I'm just not voting for a bourgeois party. I'm voting for more of a workers party. I'm voting green. I don't think they're going to win, but it is about counting our numbers. So let's go into the quotes here. They put two quote. Uh, they put two supporting uh, quotations. Quote number one, uh, the passages in dispute dealt with the British Communist Party's and declared that they should affiliate with the British Labour Party and make use of parliamentary action. Lenin evidently does not regard either of these questions as fundamental. Indeed, he considers that they are not questions of principle at all, but of tactics, which may be employed advantageously in some phases of the changing situation and discarded with advantage in others. That is Sylvia Pankhurst on her attendance at the Second Congress of the Communist International. So for all the chuds out there saying, see Vosh Red Theory, Vosh understands Marxist-Leninism better than uh, tankies do. This first quote in the document, for anyone who knows what they're talking about, is evidence that he absolutely has no idea what he's talking about. 
Sylvia, if you look up ultra leftism, Sylvia Pankhurst is one of the top five names you will see because she disagreed with Lenin on this exact type of point. So you just literally cited somebody who is disagreeing with you. But you don't know that because you're a fucking radlib who isn't a Marxist, who doesn't read theory. The passages in dispute dealt with the British Communist parties and declared that they should affiliate with the British Labour Party and make use of parliamentary action. Okay, uh, that's great. Um, the British Labour Party of that time is not the Democratic Party of today. Okay? You might have a comparable situation in which radical groups um, in the United States, like the Communist Party, like uh, more radical unions, like the CIO of the 30s, were trying to gain influence in the Democratic Party. And that was uh, 90 years ago. <laughs> okay, it was a different situation. Yeah, it's still capitalism. Yes, some of the dynamics are similar, but it, it was a different situation on the ground. It wasn't neoliberalism. It was the start of social democracy in the country. That's not at all where, where we're at right now. But also... So she continues, Levin, Lenin evidently does not regard either of these questions as fundamental. Indeed, he considers that these are not questions of principle at all, but of tactics, which may be employed advantageously in some phases of the changing situation and discarded with advantage in others. So again, I'd, I'd have to reread the speech by Pankhurst, but I don't even think she's agreeing with Lenin on this. She was one of the main people Lenin was calling out later on. So not a good supporting quote um, when the person you're quoting disagrees with you. But again, you know, I'm voting in the bourgeois election. I'm just not voting for a bourgeois party. And was the British Labour Party a bourgeois party? I'll let you answer that. Two, this is the second quote. This is from Noam Chomsky. Yeah. We've discussed Chomsky already in this broadcast. Quote, another point of disagreement is not factual, but involves the ethical moral principle addressed in one, sometimes referred to as the politics of moral witness. Generally associated with the religious left, secular leftists implicitly invoke it when they reject LEV on the grounds that, quote, a lesser of two evils is still evil. Leaving aside the obvious rejoinder that this is exactly the point of lesser evil voting, LEV, i.e. to do less evil, what needs to be challenged is the assumption that voting should be seen as a form of individual self-expression rather than as an act to be judged on its likely consequences, specifically those outlined in four. The basic moral principle at stake is simple. Not only must we take responsibility for our actions, but the consequences of our actions for others are a far more important consideration than feeling good about ourselves. Yep, um, that's why we're communists. But um, what is Chomsky's point? Vote for the lesser of two evils. Convince me that the Democrats are the lesser of two evils. We went over that in the first section. I don't see it. I really don't see it. Actually, my very first issue was imperialist war. That was what really got me into politics. Like, seriously. And uh, with some of the things Clinton was doing and especially what Bush was doing. Trump's actually better. Trump is horrible in a thousand ways. Trump makes my life worse, just as Obama made my life worse. Trump is starting fewer wars. And I don't know, to me, that's lesser evil. I'm not going to vote for Trump and I'm not going to tell anyone else to vote for Trump. But um, does this point support I mean, this, this quote from Chomsky, which all this is just appeal to authority anyway, but does this even support the, the above point? Socialists should participate in bourgeois electoralism if it is beneficial to do so and not refrain from voting on principle. No, it does not. It, it does not support that point. Chomsky is talking specifically about lesser evil voting, meaning voting for Democrats. Chomsky is supposed to be an anarchist, I thought. And he's telling you to vote for Democrats. Chomsky's full of shit is what Chomsky is for this and a number of other reasons. But no. So I reject this point as well. For one, show me that the Democrats are the lesser evil. I don't accept that. Um, show me that it in any way builds socialism. 
and show me that this has anything to do with socialists participating in bourgeois electoralism as socialists. No, no, complete fail, complete fail. All right, point C, moving on from that. Therefore, we must determine whether a victory for Biden proves American socialists a superior vantage point from which to advance the aims of a revolution. Say that again. Therefore, we must determine whether a victory for Biden provides American socialists a superior vantage point from which to advance the aims of a revolution. I say, no, it, it absolutely doesn't, and we should be building a workers' party. What does Vosh et al. say? There's one point underneath this. One, even if the revolutionary potential of a Biden presidency, come on, was equal to that of a Trump presidency, at this point, the moral socialist must still vote for Biden. End of, uh, end of argumentation. Well, I guess we're going back to uh, the 10 points of vastly superior, which I don't accept. And then uh, this whole thing about participating in bourgeois electoralism. Again, one of the main crutches here, the main pillars, is that they're trying to conflate participating in bourgeois electoralism with voting for bourgeois parties. And that is not what it means. Hopefully, we will get into that um, as this document progresses. Okay, I don't even know what the revolutionary potential of a Biden presidency and Trump presidency, what that even means. They're both right-wing parties. Neither has any revolutionary potential. Okay. So section two, my position on the potential for radicalization under Biden. Oh, maybe he's getting into, into it here. A, I do not hold that Joe Biden is a good candidate. Okay, well, we agree there. I believe the failures of a Biden administration will give socialists a better opportunity to radicalize their liberal peers than those of a Trump administration. B, this is for two. I do not agree. B, this is for two primary reasons. One. Reason one, the block of voters most susceptible to radicalization, liberal Democrats and reformist progressives, are less likely to turn to socialism if they believe capitalism's failures are a product of Trump's incompetence. And two, Trump represents a critical threat to democracy. There we go again. And leftist organizing, which could make future action, electoral or otherwise, far more difficult. No. Um, actually, this last point, I'll work backwards, I guess. This last point about it's better to get, you know, air quotes, more moderate uh, bourgeois candidates into power because, you know, the fascists might totally clamp down on the on the left wing. Are there some examples of that? Yes. Are there also examples of really successful socialist um, revolutionaries overthrowing not moderate governments, but right wing governments? Also, yes. So this is one of these things. I think it's an appeal to like air quotes, common sense. I don't know if you really broke down situation by situation that there, there's any real evidence for that. Um, is Trump attacking, you know, Antifa's terrorists and whatever? Yes, of course he is. What else is he going to do? Is Biden? Yes. Also, yes. They hate even the Bernie Sanders people. Are you fucking serious? Could they make organizing any more difficult than it already is? No. Was the FBI already targeting anarchists and other leftists prior to Trump? Yes. Read a book called Green is the New Red. Forget who the author is. Yes, absolutely. So this whole idea that like Biden is the lesser of two evils, there's no evidence for it. And, you know, again, we just got a list of bullet points rather than like actual breakdowns and explanations of that. So um, potential for radicalization. Now, back to point one, the block of voters most susceptible to radicalization, liberal Democrats and reformist progressives are less likely to turn to socialism if they believe capitalist capitalism's failures are a product of Trump's incompetence. I mean, that's true. But is getting Biden into power going to change that like they're. Liberals, because they haven't been convinced of Marxist ideology, they and they haven't been convinced of Marxist ideology, most likely because they haven't been exposed to it. Not because, oh, they're like super up on Marxism, but they just really believe it's Trump. 
that's not really the case. It's that socialists need to keep catapulting the propaganda, so to speak. W would be proud. Um, we need to keep getting out there with videos, with meme pages, with whatever. Keep attacking and discrediting liberalism. That's how you do it. You don't hand them power. Actually, you know, ironically, this is the folly that um, the German ultra left made with the Nazis, which was hand them power and let them discredit themselves with the trap of state power. That's not what happened. Again, we have a situation in the United States where we have two right wing parties and the left is advocating for voting for one over the other. Just get it out of your head. Vote for the socialist. Vote for the socialist. Don't vote for the bourgeois. All right. Anyway, but this idea that we're going to radicalize liberals, first of all, e easier said than done, but we're going to radicalize liberals by electing Biden. Think about what you're saying. No one even believes Biden is progressive. And people who do think that he's progressive don't mean progressive. <laughs> it's the same people who thought Hillary Clinton was progressive when she called herself progressive. It's people for whom progressive really doesn't mean anything, which it kind of does. I mean, you know, reform, reformist capitalists, basically. Um, this, is a, this is a very bad point that does not have any evidence to back it up. Done with that. And then moving back here, I believe the failures of a Biden administration will give socialists a better opportunity to radicalize their liberal peers. Again, I don't think that either of the, the reasons given for that hold up. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. All right. Section three now, participation in bourgeois electoralism. A, virtually every leftist theorist advocates for participation in bourgeois electoralism to some degree. No argument here. The thing that I'm arguing is that you're conflating participation in bourgeois electoralism with voting for bourgeois parties. That's not what it fucking means. And that's what we're going to go through in every single one of these. I am fairly certain because I did hear parts of the video. All right. So first up, we have two Engels quotes. Number one, that are supposedly in, in you know, this, this, uh, this in support of this. We seek the abolition of classes, comment, just like Joe Biden, right? What is the means of achieving it? The political domination of the proletariat. Revolution is the supreme act of politics. Whoever wants it must also want the means, political action, which prepares for it, which gives the workers the education for revolution and without which the workers will always be duped. But the politics which are needed are working class politics. The workers' party must be constituted not as the tail of some bourgeois party, but as an independent party with its own objective, its own politics. Engels following the collapse of the first international. Literally, that quote supports not voting for Democrats. I don't know why you would cite it when your whole argument is we should vote for Democrats. Maybe Vosh can explain that at some point. I mean, I feel like I could just rest my case right here. Engels literally said the politics which are needed are working class politics the workers party must be constituted not as the tail of some bourgeois party but as an independent party with its own objective its own politics well that's the green party howie hawkins i put up on my channel wrote a whole pamphlet about this it's an hour-long video go listen to it i read the entire thing into the microphone that's it's called the case for an independent left party. So if you want the candidate who most closely matches that, you want Howie Hawkins. You do not want Joe Biden. Bernie Sanders represents the failed attempt to incorporate working class parties or politics as, quote, the tail of some bourgeois party. It's not working. They fucking sidelined him, then used him as a sheepdog to try to dupe your dumb ass into voting for them. That's what they did. So literally that first quote, while it supports the point of participating in bourgeois elections, it says to do so as an independent party with working class politics, not as a bourgeois party. So vote green or PSL. So that 
last little thing just broke my brain so much I had to take a break for a few minutes. But literally, Voss just defeated his own argument with his first quote. The whole idea here was he was trying to show up Marxist-Leninists using Marxist-Leninist theory. His very first attempt to do so resulted in a face plant. Engels right here. <laughs> I've said it before. I'll say it again. The politics which are needed are working class politics. The workers party must be constituted not as the tail of some bourgeois party, but as an independent party with its own objective. If you agree with that, you are not going to vote for Joe Biden. So would Engels have told you to vote for Joe Biden? Fuck no. All right, moving on. Here's the second quote, also from Engels. And if universal suffrage had offered no other advantage than that it allowed us to count our numbers every three years, that by the regularly established unexpectedly rapid rise in our vote, it increased in equal measure the workers' certainty of victory and the dismay of their opponents, and so became our best means of propaganda, that it accurately informed us, us of our own strength and that of all opposing parties, and thereby provided us with a measure of proportion second to none for our actions, safeguarding us from untimely timidity, as much as from untimely foolhardiness. If this had been the only advantage we gained from the suffrage, it would still have been much more than enough. But it did more than this by far. In election propaganda, it provided us with a means, second to none, of getting in touch with the mass of the people where they still stand aloof from us, of forcing all parties to defend their views and actions against our attacks before all the people, and further, it provided our representatives in the Reichstag with a platform from which they could speak to their opponents in Parliament and to the masses outside with quite a different authority and freedom than in the press or at meetings. That is Engels, the class struggle in France. So, again, I am in complete agreement with this, but he is not telling you to vote for a bourgeois party. When he says that universal suffrage has, quote, allowed us to count our numbers, who does he mean by us? He means communists. He doesn't mean Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. What he is saying in this quote, because apparently Vosh and his fans who buy this nonsense that Vosh is putting out there can't follow the basic logical implications of, of the evidence that they're citing. What Engels is saying here clearly is that we socialists, communists, are able by running candidates to gauge our popularity with the public via the vote count. Now, in the United States, I am not at all convinced that we have accurate vote counts. I still advocate for voting anyway. Um, this is a, actually what Engel says here. This is exactly why, as I understand it, PSL runs a candidate, and only in California. They run a candidate in California, which is a solid blue state. They can never be accused of you know, spoiling the election and having California go Republican, because it's never going to go Republican. But they um, they run a candidate just to gauge how popular is Marxism Leninism because they're a Marxist Leninist party. Well, that's exactly what Engels is saying here: is that the good thing about running candidates lets uh, is propaganda. Like when they get when they do well in the elections, it shows the working class: hey, there's a lot of us who think this way. Okay, that's what he's saying. Um. I don't know actually how you can get any other interpretation out of that, but that is clearly what he is saying. So it doesn't mean vote for Joe Biden because of the Supreme Court or something. It says run socialist candidates and vote for socialist candidates, which Biden clearly is not because it will be good propaganda when we get a good result. And it will also even when the results aren't good, as he says, safeguarding us from untimely timidity, meaning we shouldn't be overly timid when our numbers are good, as much as from untimely foolhardiness, meaning we shouldn't be overconfident when the numbers aren't there. So he's saying that, again, running candidates um, in the election 
gives communists a good gauge as to how popular they are so that it allows us to strategize accordingly. Even if you don't think you're ultimately going to stage the revolution, i.e. the changing in power uh, or the, the changing of which class rules society, which is a revolution, is a change in the ruling class, not just a ruling faction. Even if you don't think that the revolution is going to happen through elections, there are advantages to running candidates, which he has just outlined. But none of this supports voting for bourgeois parties. So I'm sorry, your first two pieces of, of evidence don't support your point. All right, now the third. <clears throat> Quote, the fact that parliament is an institution of the bourgeois state can in no way be used as an argument against participating in the parliamentary struggle. The Communist Party does not enter these institutions in order to work as an integral part of them. Rather, it does so to use parliament to help the masses to take action to break up the state machine and the parliament itself. Theses on the Communist Party's and parliamentarism. I agree. That still... Is Joe Biden running in the Communist Party for fuck's sake? No, he isn't. Yes, this is an argument for running communists in government, because if you get a communist in a government, they might be able to do some sabotage from within, kind of like Trump is doing on behalf of the capitalists, kind of like libertarians want to dismantle the state uh, to, you know, get rid of environmental protections and workers' rights and shit like that to just like go back to totally unrestrained classical liberalism, uh, you know, free reign capitalism. Okay, so it says right in the quote, though, the Communist Party uh, enters parliament to help the masses take action to break up the state machine. Joe Biden's not a fucking communist. He's a right wing pro segregation fucking piece of shit. So. That does not support your idea of voting for Joe Biden. Sorry to tell you. And then number four, lastly. Therefore, it stands that participation in bourgeois democracy can establish the conditions for revolution. A, it follows that anyone who makes jokes about voting in socialism is woefully unfamiliar with literature on the subject. Okay, now I got to comment on that because like I just said, I actually like the quote just said. The Communist Party can use Parliament to help the masses take action to break up the state machine. That's a far cry from voting in socialism. Okay, those are not the same things. It, to weaken the state to help a revolution, which may very well be extra parliamentary outside the parliament, that's one thing. Voting it in, that's a different question. So again, they conflate an important question with another one. Uh, so that's that's really a misrepresentation right there. So don't get sucked into that. And then B, interestingly, Marx actually did believe it was possible to achieve socialism peacefully through democracy. And then there's a Marx quote from speech La Liberté. You know that the institutions, mores and traditions of various countries must be taken into consideration. We do not deny that there are countries such as America, England, and if I add Holland, where the workers can attain their goal by peaceful means. Uh, actually, I think he cut out part of the quote about Holland. But anyway, where the workers can attain their goal by peaceful means. This being the case, we must also recognize that the, the fact that in most countries on the continent, meaning Europe, the lever of our revolution must be force. It is force to which we must someday appeal in order to erect the rule of labor. So actually in that quote, Mark says that like the, his phrasing is, we do not deny that there are countries uh, where the workers might be able to attain their goal by peaceful means. He says can attain their goal by peaceful means, but possibly. And then he said this being the case in most countries, the lever of the revolution must be force. So Marx is basically saying there's an outside chance that in some of these countries you might be able to have a peaceful transition uh, from capitalism to socialism. Just at, like in some countries, and as they go into in theory, air quotes, capital T, uh, Marx and Engels talk about how in some places the transition from feudalism to capitalism was more peaceful. And then, like, for instance, um, when 
the nobility that was part of the feudal ruling class saw the writing on the wall and they thought it was in their best interest to like join with the capitalist class rather than try to fight them and probably lose. Um, there are, you know, every country, it's a spectrum. Every country is somewhere on that line of like peaceful to violent. And then there are other countries like the USA. And I got to say, Marx here was completely, you know, he was not an American. He was not deeply familiar with the customs and mores of America. And he was completely wrong um, that either England or America, you know, or Holland for that matter, could peacefully transition to socialism. He was making a guess. He said it's possible that there are countries that could have a peaceful transition to socialism, but in most countries it's going to be a forceful one. So, yeah, again, does this, um, does any of this support voting for Joe Biden? No. It, it supports the idea that socialists have something to gain by running and voting for socialists in the bourgeois government. Joe Biden not being a socialist, it doesn't fucking apply. Okay. Now we're on to section four. What of collaboration with bourgeois or reformist parties? Okay, well, now we're getting, you know, closer to the target here. All right, point A. Lenin wrote extensively on the British Labor Party, which he was not fond of. And there are a number of quotes here. Number one, quote, Millions of backward members are enrolled in the Labor Party, therefore communists should be present to do propaganda amongst them, provided communist freedom of action and propaganda is not thereby limited. When afterwards in the Kremlin, I argued with Lenin privately that the disadvantages of affiliation outweighed those of disaffiliation, he dismissed the subject as unimportant, saying that the Labor Party would probably refuse to accept the par Communist Party's affiliation and that, in any case, the decision could be altered next year, unquote. This is, again, Sylvia Pankhurst on her attendance at the Second Congress of the Communist International. This is the, the same person and the same piece that was quoted much earlier that we already discussed. Sylvia Pankhurst is an ultra-left, I believe one of the ones who Lenin calls out in left-wing communism and infantile disorder. Which I think he, uh, from listening to this, I think he's also going to cite Lenin and like try to use these as like interchangeable. Anyway, so this is Sylvia Pankhurst talking about Lenin. Uh, the next quote, when, however, it is argued that communists should not go into reformist labor parties or bourgeois parliaments because they may be affected by the environment and lose the purity of their communist faith and fervor, Lenin replies that after the proletarian conquest of power, the temptation to weaken in principle will be much greater. He argues that those who cannot withstand all tests before the revolution will certainly not do so later. Lenin argued that in order to explode the futility of reformism and to bring communism to pass, the Labor Party must have a trial in office. Therefore, British communists should affiliate their party to the Labor Party and come to arrangements with it for the formation of a joint parliamentary bloc and the mutual sharing out of constituencies. And then, quote, um, representing this idea, please, Mr. Henderson, take the power. Mr. Henderson of the Labor Party, take the power. You today represent the opinions of the majority of British workers. We know that, as yet we do not. Therefore, we cannot at present take the power. But you who represent the opinions of the masses should take the power. Um, this actually continues in like point five and six, but let's comment for a minute. So they're talking here about the British Labor Party from when Lenin was still alive, which was like a hundred years ago. So very different conditions, different stage of capitalism, very different situation. But what they're saying here is Lenin is advocating for... It, it, it almost seems like they're using this to bolster the point that like Biden having a trial in office is going to radicalize liberals. <clears throat> this was a hundred years ago. Like, that point has been proven a million times over. We are already at a situation where only a quarter of the electorate votes Democrat. Like, the people we have stripped out have been stripped out. Half the electorate doesn't vote. What we need are socialist parties to organize those people. We do not need Biden in office. Do you get that? 
Okay? The working class already doesn't believe in the Democratic Party. Vosh almost seems to be de-radicalizing people to, like, get them to work more closely to, like, get people to vote Democrat. That's going backwards. We've already got 50% of potential voters, working class people, who don't vote for either Republican or Democrat. We need to organize those people. Forget Joe Biden. You need to work with the people who are already low-hanging fruit right in front of your fucking face. Voting for Biden, this is futile and pointless. You're literally just helping the capitalist class regenerate its credibility. That's all you're doing. You know, after George W. Bush, the Republican Party, and to some extent capitalism as a whole, was discredited. Like, totally fucking discredited. That's why the Republican Party had to completely reinvent itself with the shock troops of the Tea Party, proto-fascism, birtherism and then trump became um president because the whole like jeb bush mitt romney wing was discredited they were they were totally and thoroughly discredited by the outcomes of of of, you know their their rule then we got obama and it like rehabbed the whole fucking system and then trump got elected and we're just going to keep doing this dance this is a hundred years on. Also, the British Labour Party of a hundred years ago is not the Democratic Party of 2020. And as far as this whole thing about making a, you know, uh, a block or, you know, a, some kind of a, uh, a pact between socialists and Democrats, the Democrats have spoken. They don't even want to deal with Bernie Sanders, let alone the Socialist Party that we have yet to fucking organize. Well, actually, if we want to say that the Greens are the closest thing to a national workers' party, you know, there is PSL, but they're just in a few places. The Greens are the closest to a national workers' party. How do the Democrats treat the Greens? You think they're going to fucking compromise with the Greens? Hell no. They don't go for Green votes. They go for Republican votes. They go for the mythical, air quotes, moderate Republican And they just tell everyone to their left to fuck off. They've done this time and again. When are you going to get it? All right. So going on, I I don't really feel like these quotes really support any of the apparent points. But anyway, it goes on. If the Hendersons and the Snowdens of the Labor Party reject a block with the communists, the latter will immediately gain by winning the sympathy of the masses and discrediting the Hendersons and Snowdens. Okay, well, let's comment right there. Arguably the closest we've got here, Bernie Sanders is not a communist. Um, But that's already happened. And the Bernie people are already not voting for Joe Biden. You're actually telling the Bernie people to vote for Joe Biden. You're telling them to go backwards. You're telling them to go backwards, Vosh. And all the little Vosh acolytes listening to this. You're telling people to go backwards. I don't get this. Okay, well, no, I do get it. I think you fucking are a liberal and you're fine trying to fucking re- rehabilitate the Democratic Party and capitalism in general. All right, anyway, if as a result we do lose a few parliamentary seats, it is a matter of no significance to us. And then in bold here, we would put up our candidates in a very few but absolutely safe, safe constituencies, namely constituencies where our candidatures would not give any seats to the liberals at the expense of the labor candidates. Okay. But what are we talking about here? Liberals and labor. Well, this, this is what I said about PSL before, how they just run in California, right? Um, is the Democrat Party the, the labor party here? No, I think that we have two liberal parties. There's like a far right liberal party and a uh, just a right wing liberal party, the Republicans and the Democrats, respectively. I don't know why they're even citing this stuff. We would take part in the election campaign, distribute distribute leaflets agitating for communism, and in all constituencies where we have no candidates, we would urge the electors to vote for the labor candidate and against the bourgeois candidate. Well, Joe Biden's a bourgeois candidate, and you're telling people, Vosh, to vote for him. Comrades Sylvia Pankhurst and Gallagher are mistaken in thinking that this is a betrayal of communism. So again, right there, I believe they're quoting Lenin now, although they don't cite him till way uh yeah this is lenin left-wing communism in great britain um they don't cite him until like the next page <coughs> but as i said before um when they're citing pankhurst 
Lenin's saying right here that she's mistaken, that this is a betrayal of communism or a renunciation of the struggle against the social traitors, meaning um, social chauvinists or social fascists. On the contrary, the cause of communist revolution would undoubtedly gain thereby. After all, the German lefts cannot but know that the entire history of Bolshevism, both before and after the October Revolution, is full of instances of changes of tack, conciliatory tactics, and compromises with other parties, including bourgeois parties. Comment, yeah, when it's advantageous to do so. Right now, um, making concessions to the Democratic Party, who are not giving us anything in return, that's not advantageous. That's strategy 101. We have nothing to gain. They don't want to work with us, okay? I mean, are you clear on that? Look at how they treated Bernie Sanders. Look at how they treated Ralph Nader. Look how they continue to treat the Green Party and Jill Stein. <clears throat> they don't want to make compromises. If, if you don't get that, get out of politics because you don't understand what you're doing. All right, so going on with Lenin here. To carry on a war for the overthrow of the international bourgeoisie, a war which is a hundred times more difficult, protracted, and complex than the most stubborn, stubborn of ordinary wars between states, and to renounce in advance any change of tack or any utilization of a conflict of interest, even if temporary, among one's enemies, or any conciliation or compromise with possible allies, even if they are temporary, unstable, vacillating, or conditional allies. Is that not ridiculous in the extreme? The German Independent Social Democratic Party is obviously not a homogeneous body. Along, alongside the old opportunist leaders, Kautsky, Hilferding, and apparently, to a considerable extent, Crispin, Lebedor, and others, these have re revealed their inability to understand the significance of Soviet power and the dictatorship of the proletariat and their inability to lead the proletariat's revolutionary struggle. There has emerged in this party a left and proletarian wing, which is growing most rapidly. Hundreds of thousands of members in this party, which has, I think, a membership of some three quarters of a million, are proletarians who are abandoning Scheidemann and are rapidly going over to communism. The errors of the left communists <clears throat> are particularly dangerous at present because certain revolutionaries are not displaying a sufficiently thoughtful, sufficiently attentive, sufficiently intelligent, and sufficiently shrewd attitude toward each, each of these conditions. If we are the party of the revolutionary class and not merely a revolutionary group, and if we want the masses to follow us, and unless we achieve that, we stand the risk of remaining mere windbags, we must first help Henderson or Snowden to beat George Lloyd and Churchill, or rather compel the former to beat the latter because the former are afraid of their victory. Second, we must help the majority of the working class to be convinced by their own experience that we are right, i.e. that the Hendersons and Snowdens are absolutely good for nothing, that they are petty bourgeois and treacherous by nature, and that their bankruptcy is inevitable. It is true that the Hendersons, the Kleinses, the McDonalds, and the Snowdens are hopelessly reactionary. It is equally true that they want to assume power, though they would prefer a coalition with the bourgeoisie, that they want to rule along the old bourgeois lines, and that when they are in power, they will certainly behave like the Scheidemans and Noskis. All that is true, but it does not at all follow that to support them means treachery to the revolution. What does follow is that in the interests of the revolution, working class revolutionaries should give these gentlemen a certain amount of parliamentary support. So that is a very long, almost two full page set of quotes from and about Lenin's views on this. And they're irrelevant because... What he is talking about here in terms of the Social Democratic Party and the Labor Party, we're talking more about like a Bernie Sanders type of situation. Like it's the difference of communists versus Bernie Sanders, not Bernie Sanders versus Joe Biden. So the entire thing is this is the same thing that Chomsky did. He shifted everything over like a notch from the to the left or the right, depending on how you're looking at it. And he's drawing parallels that are not there. The communists can work with social Democrats sometimes. Okay. I, I, I hold that myself. It's possible to compromise with social Democrats, even though they're petty bourgeois reactionary and just not good for our cause outright. Uh, there may be some strategic advantage to working with them and exposing them. 
We're talking here, though, about electing a Bernie Sanders to expose him, not electing a Joe Biden. People like Joe Biden have been elected time and time again. They've already been discredited to as many people as they can be discredited to. That's not what Lenin is talking about. If you don't understand that, go reread it again. Go look up what these parties were like. It's They're talking about communists, which Bernie Sanders definitely is not, working with Social Democrats, not Social Democrats working with you know, uh, laissez-faire capitalists. That's not what's going on. All right. Moving on to section B here. Engels wrote on workers' rights and wrote workers' rights organizations and labor unions. One, quote, in England, France, and Belgium, where the bourgeoisie rules, the communists still have a common interest with the various democratic parties, an interest which is all the greater the more closely the socialistic measures they champion approach the aims of the communists. That is, the more clearly and definitely they represent the interests of the proletariat and the more they depend on the proletariat for support. In England, for example, the working class chartists are infinitely closer to the communists than the democratic petty bourgeoisie or the so-called radicals. In America, where a democratic constitution has already been established, the communists must make the common cause with the party which will turn this constitution against the bourgeoisie and use it in the interests of the proletariat. That is with the agrarian national reformers. Comment. Is Joe Biden running for the national reformers ticket? No, he isn't. This should be super clear to everyone by now. This is not what Engels is talking about. Okay, back to the quote. In Switzerland, the radicals, though a very mixed party, are the only group with which the communists can cooperate. And among these radicals, the Vaudois and Genovese are the most advanced. Engels, the principles of communism. So S4A says, well, okay, the Green Party is not a communist party. There's a lot of left liberal and reactionary elements to the Green Party. But out of all the parties that exist in the United States, they are the closest one that communists could work with because they don't take corporate money. Like there's just those that checklist of things that just means, you know, at the ground floor, it's it's possible to work with them. Can you work in the Democratic Party? No. Bernie Sanders showed even a social Democrat will be rebuffed thoroughly. They will destroy you. Also, please, again, go listen or read. Uh, listen to the Howie Hawkins, The Case for an Independent Left Party, because he talks about this. The Democratic Party, the modern Democratic Party, not what was going on in the 18. 18- 40s when Engels wrote the principles of communism with Marx 18 fucking 40s different stage of capitalism 180 years ago different stage of capitalism again uh, you know Joe Biden definitely you know clinching the national reformers endorsement Jesus Imagine using this as evidence, like with a straight face for your modern let's vote for Joe Biden point. It's a pathetic, pathetic reach. I mean, just shameful, shameful. And if you're listening to this guy, please understand him for the fraud that he is. Bosh, I mean. All right. Where was I? Oh, yeah, the Green Party. Go listen to Howie Hawkins, The Case for an Independent Left Party, because he talks about how the modern Democratic Party is set up that if you work within them, they make you renounce your ties to every other group. It means that, you know, forming a sort of de facto coalition by like invading or infecting their party, but then like kind of keeping your ties with an outside group that is socialist, the Democrats don't allow it. They make you renounce all other groups. They trap you in their party. So that is a condition. You know, if they didn't do that, working within them as Hawkins elaborates on at length might be possible, but they do. So those are the conditions. Sorry to shout, but this is just how many times do we have to go over this ground. You know, people need to get educated. Okay. So that the greens are a party you can work with, not the Republicans, not the Democrats. 
then the Libertarian Party is is a pile of shit. If you're going to work with a third party, work with the Greens, not the Libertarians. Okay, Libertarians were basically formed as an anti-communist party. So not a good idea. All right. That's the end of Section 4. I got to say, I got nothing out of that as far as voting for Joe Biden and actually some evidence for not voting for Joe Biden from theory. Okay, Section 5. Do these examples apply to the Democrat Party? Well, that's what I was just talking about. No, they don't. But let's see how Vosh tries to distort reality to fit his marching orders of trying to get his audience to vote for Biden. Do these examples apply to the Democrat Party? A, material conditions dictate the strategy leftists must adopt to advocate revolution. Uh, yes. Also, please don't use terms that you yourself don't believe in. All this is is liberals trying to co-opt radical language to make you vote liberal. That's what it is. It's insulting. It's offensive. And you should give them the finger and just tell them to fuck off. Bosh, fuck off. Stop co-opting language you don't yourself use or believe in. Material conditions dictate the strategy leftists must adopt to advocate revolution. Yes, and voting for Biden is not among them. One, modern American society would be unfathomable to the old theorists. Comment, so why are you quoting Engels endorsing the National Reformers Party? Okay, uh, a, highly complex systems of global trade. That's wrong. Marx writes about that all the time. B, sophisticated corporate media and ideology. No, I don't think that that would be unfathomable at all. C, complete corporate control of media dispersal. Really? Because early communists didn't talk about the bourgeois press. Interesting. D, surveillance state. There were spies everywhere back in those days. You went to a coffee shop, there was a spy, guaranteed. It was different technology, but there was surveillance everywhere, everywhere. They just used, you know, manpower, not cameras. E, complacency of the proletariat. I mean, to claim that that's somehow different now is just flat wrong. <clears throat> I think that why um, one of the reasons that there was a big uptick in socialist organizing in around the turn of the century, some of it was um, Eastern European immigrants who had like, you know, not had electric lights in their country and stuff like that, suddenly coming to like a big city like New York, where life is just governed by the time clock and these completely foreign to them rhythms. And it was like this completely abrupt change in their entire customs and lifestyle. And it was very easy to get them on board with like capitalism is totally inhumane. Yeah, people are much more conditioned to it now being like third or fourth generation into this system. But, um, you know, that's that's been an issue for a while. There's always been complacency. Go look up the old um, IWW cartoons about Mr. Block, the blockhead. Go look that up. That's all I'm going to say. Those comics are from uh, over a century ago. OK. Um, F transition to a service economy. I don't know what point they're trying to make here, but that's not uh, not really a good one. Um, G, resilience of modern capitalism. Again, I don't really know what point they're trying to make exactly. H, old form revolutions now essentially impossible. So now we're at the crux of it. They're not really defining what old form revolutions means, but um, I'll just put it on them. Back up your point. First of all, define your term and then explain why. You can't just list that and then just claim it as true when you haven't provided any evidence for its being true. I, universal suffrage utterly neutered. Dude, you literally just kneecapped your own argument for voting for Biden. You literally just, you played yourself. I don't know exactly what this means because there's no follow-up, but universal suffrage utterly neutered. So why are you telling people to vote? Like, this is so bizarre. Jay, little to no union representation. Um, I mean, that's a fact, but that's been the case at various times before. I don't know exactly where they're going with that, but I don't think it would be incomprehensible or unfathomable at all. 
K class collaboration. That was a thing then too. Um, look up the history of the AFL, American Federation of Labor, what the IWW used to call the AF of hell for their constant collaboration with the capitalist class so that they could have their members be the privileged white male breadwinner um, labor aristocracy. That was a thing then too. Uh, L. Also, I, I got to say, like the masters of old, I mean, Stalin was the head of the Soviet Union till the late 50s. Like, do you think these things weren't going on then? I don't know. It's it's just strange. Um, yeah. Rampant patriotism. Yeah, that was also a thing then. Go look at some World War One propaganda. OK, that was, you know, contemporary to Lenin. Uh, unbreakable two party system. Okay, so here's your defeatism. I mean, speaking right there. Um, if you don't build the Socialist Party, then you, then the two-party system will be unbreakable. No doubt the two parties put up... The, I mean, these are actually arguments for not voting. <laughs> Those are arguments for not voting. So I feel like they're working across purposes, just kind of like throwing whatever at the wall to see what sticks. I'm in favor of building a Socialist Party and running it, it may be that we don't, you know, achieve final victory through an election. It, it may be by force eventually in the end. But I believe in building a, a workers' party and running it and voting for it. Saying that there's an unbreakable two-party system. So I think really what this is leading up to is saying, if you can't beat them, join them. Or like pick the lesser of two evils. But I mean, and this point has been made... Uh, thousand times just in the last few months on social media it's 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 basic logic if you have two parties that are owned by capitalists which they are and they know and you're telling them that their power is unbreakable what incentive do they have to listen to you it's like this was it, this is like the old um the old thing of uh Whoever said that uh, you can't fight City Hall probably worked there. Unbreakable two-party system, huh? Gee, I wonder who wrote this. Vosh. Wonder who you work for, bud. All right, Section B. It is undeniable that the Democrat Party is far, far further to the right than the old British Labor Party. Does this make a comparison impossible? Yes. So why did you just spend all this? This would have been a good question to like... This is a very poorly organized document, I have to say. This would have been a much better thing to put way earlier, and it's making this lab uh, making this breakdown much more labored than it needs to be. But okay, so does this make a comparison impossible? One, first, remember Bernie Sanders is himself to the right of the old British Labor Party. Second, remember why Lenin advocated support for labor. A, to prevent the rise of an anti-democratic right. Well, too late there. B, to radicalize and mobilize reformist voters. Okay, well, even reformists are shut out. Joe Biden and Kamala are not reformists, although they pretend to be, which Vosh is trying to get us to believe and buy into that illusion. C, to count our numbers. And D, to showcase to the proletariat the failures of reformist policy, which would be a Bernie Sanders type policy, or even to the left of Bernie Sanders. Um, I think Corbyn arguably is a little bit to the left of Bernie Sanders. So it's like the idea of get a Sanders or a Corbyn in. Well, that's not Vosh's argument. Vosh's argument is get Biden in, which has no relationship to this. OK, three, I believe given the change in material conditions, what does that mean? And available avenues for radicalization. These arguments apply to the modern Democratic Party. <laughs> what? How did you arrive at that? I'm going to read this whole thing again without break. It is undeniable that the Democrat Party is far, far further to the right than the old British Labor Party. Does this make a comparison impossible? Remember that Bernie Sanders is to the right of the old British Party and he's way to the left of the Democrats. Remember why Lenin advocated support for labor to prevent the rise of an anti-democratic right, which is both parties, to radicalize and mobilize reformists, to count our numbers, to showcase the failures of reformism. I believe, given the change in material conditions and available avenues for radicalization, these arguments apply to the modern Democrat Party. Okay, unless he's going to explain that later, 
I am throwing up my hands as like, I literally have no idea what the fuck he's talking about. Like, I really don't know what that is supposed to mean or how he arrived at that because like in a lot of other places in this document, he seems to cite evidence that contradicts the point he's trying to make. I mean, is this like some sort of weird gullibility test to like just uh, attract like the absolute most fucking foolable, gullible dupes into Vosh's audience so that he just has this like hardcore concentrated audience of dupes who just like can't reason out of a paper, wet paper bag. This is like a wet paper bag that's been floating for a month. It's like breaking up on its own. There's holes in it already. That's kind of amazing. If, if you think this makes some kind of sense that I'm not seeing, leave it in the comments, but I don't, I don't see it. <laughs> All right, section six. We're just going to move on, I guess. Uh, Vosh decides. Maintaining bourgeois democracy as our opponent. Uh, what? Maintaining bourgeois democracy as our opponent. Okay getting whiplash from the subject change but a trump represents a severe threat to our democracy again we covered this the democracy is over more so than a typical bourgeois reactionary president no <laughs> um so why do i say no go look at greg palast's work p-a-l-a-s-t he's been doing documentaries since 2000 on the voting machines and how easily hacked they are and how we don't have real elections anymore, which incidentally, does, does the Democratic Party talk about that? No, it's all a big game of good cop, bad cop. The Democrats come in, they're the good cop, they give you a cup of water, it's nothing, it's water, but it's a, it's a gesture, they're the party of empty gestures. They come in and they're like, hey, look, you know, I get it, I mean, you're going through a hard time. You had to break into that house. Oh, hold on. My partner's coming in. And then the bad cop, the Republicans come in. And they throw you up against the wall and they shout in your face. And then the good cop comes back in after a few minutes after you're all roughed up. They're like, hey, man, back off of him. And then they're like, are you OK? I'm so I'm so sorry. My partner gets out of line sometimes. Can I get you something to eat? Do you want like a banana or something? You want a Coke or a Pepsi? That's what we've got going on. Um, but they're both there to bust you. They're both there to fuck you up. They're just playing with your head. That's it. That's what they're doing. So the democracy thing, it's gone. Do the Democrats talk about anything of substance? I remember a couple of videos of Howard Dean in 2004 showing how easily the um, election systems were hacked because they like ran on Windows XP and uh, they uh, you could just get into the file where all the votes were stored and it was like a simple spreadsheet. And did they ever do anything about it? No. Will they ever? No. They're there as controlled opposition, the Democrats. They're there as good cop, period. If there was any semblance of democracy, Bernie Sanders would be probably the nominee or he'd at least be a major, you know, uncontested force within the Democratic Party. He'd have like a serious foothold because there would be a belief in, you know, well, the people have spoken, yada, yada, that's democracy. We don't have that. We have a veiled corporate dictatorship masquerading as a democracy. To think otherwise is utter foolishness. All right, let's move on. And yeah, if you're trying to say that this um, goes against the idea of what I said before, building the Workers' Party and voting for them, I don't think they count the votes. I've said this in other videos. I don't think they count, but I vote in case they do. All right. But I'm not voting Dem. I'm voting Green. All right. And regardless, at the end of the day, you're still building the party. Is Vosh out there saying that, by the way? Is he out there for building a vanguard party that like, will actually organize workers and represent the leading edge of class consciousness that can actually lead workers out of capitalism into a sustained new order, not just like immediate anarchy where like it's this utopian fantasy that everything is just great from the start does he do that i don't think he does let me know in the comments in fact i think he's openly hostile to to uh tankies who uh marxist leninists who do advocate for that all right so getting back to this stupid fucking document 
A, Trump represents a severe threat to our democracy, more so than a typical bourgeois reactionary president. Well, no. One, complete ideological control of his political party. There are no real meaningful ideological differences in any of the parties, aside from Bernie Sanders. They're all, you know, 39 shades of uh, free market capitalism. Two, violent, zealous, cultish fan base. Now, I agree with that. That existed before Trump, though. That is a phenomenon growing out of the backwardness, um, the impenetrable backwardness of particularly the old Confederacy, but, you know, r the Rust Belt as well. Um, the disaffected, non-class conscious, non-Marxist educated working class of America, particularly older Gen X and boomers, and then even older, some like of the remaining greatest generation people, those go back and look 2008 at the Tea Party and 2009. They're mostly older white people, same people that went for Trump, but Trump didn't really come on the scene till like 2012. Um, this predates Trump. And yeah, those people like Trump for now. They'll gladly latch on to somebody else. The fan base is the problem. That's a symptom of something else. Obama and Biden didn't do jack shit to curtail it during their eight years. So there's a more fundamental problem there. All right. Three, brazen electoral interference. Are we really doing Russiagate here? If you're doing Russiagate, let's suffice to say, I do not think that that was a significant factor in the election. Um, that's not a hill I need to die on right now, but I don't. But we've already established the elect. So I believe it's like um, over a quarter of the states have no paper trail to the vote. You vote on an electronic machine and there's no paper trail, like making a recount impossible, a physical recount. So, yeah, we already don't have real elections in the United States. We just don't. OK, um, actually, even during the Democratic primaries this time around, there was and in 2016, there was significant evidence that the elections were tampered with significant. You can go back through S4A from this uh, spring, January, February, March and April for posts about that. I mean, they were caught like throwing away. There was like a room full of uh, mail in ballots that were just getting thrown away. So this is not particular to Trump. It happens with the Democrats, too. They're in on it, man. They're in on it. I don't know how else to say it. They're in on it. Voting for them is not going to work to get us out of this. Building a socialist party is, okay? Not just to win elections, but to, like, be socialist and take power. My God. Okay. Uh, open disdain for checks and balances on his power. Well, Bush said the same thing. This is not, uh, you know... How much power does Trump actually have? You know, whatever. I just, these, these are such lib talking points. It's kind of like, I, I'm not used to responding to these talking points because they're just, I feel like most people who enter leftist discourse are just already past most of this stuff. This is like the Democratic Party wrote it. Five, cult of personality. Well, this is pretty redundant with the violent, zealous, cultish fan base so i'm going to discard that under that point apparent impunity to legal reprimand breaks laws unchallenged now this is an interesting one so the democrats put a lot of eggs in their pr basket related to impeachment then they ran a joke of an impeachment effort there were um pro-impeachment democrats that were more progressive and say kind of radical stuff uh you know, it's like somewhere in the middle of DSA type stuff. It's Albert something. I can't remember the guy's name from Texas, but um, I think it's Albert anyway, who was one of the very first pro impeachment people for just like off the bat emoluments stuff, like right after Trump got elected. And then by the time that Pelosi and the rest of them got in on it, in other words, upper Dem leadership, which would definitely include people like Biden. It got watered down to a point where they ran a joke of an impeachment campaign against Trump that was easy for him to wriggle out of. He did wriggle out of it. And in fact, he came out looking like the victim. So they fucking helped him in the end. Do you see that? It gave him support among his base because they're just like, oh, see, they're all out to get him, but it's baseless. And he's strong enough. He's strong. He fought it off. 
when they weren't, I don't believe they were really trying to impeach him. Anyway, this system was built to veer towards fascism when in crisis, and that's exactly what it's doing. Okay? It, it, this isn't about democracy. It, it's about the system is built for fascism. Anytime that capitalism comes under threat, real or perceived, this is what it does. And it is coming under real threat because we had an, uh, Bill Clinton signed Tim Geithner of Goldman Sachs, I believe, uh, his uh, legislation that he wrote, de- uh, well, not de- it's a deregulation piece of legislation, but basically um, undoing the Glass-Steagall Act. He, Clinton signed off on that. What happened? We got a major economic collapse in 2008. Major. It had shockwaves around the entire world. Well, the history of that, when the capitalist economy is not regulated in the way that Glass-Steagall regulated it, which Bill Clinton undid as one of the last things he did before leaving office, Historically, you have a crash of that magnitude. They used to call them banking panics, among other things, every 10 to 15 years. Well, that was 2008. We're in 2020. And COVID is certainly contributing to it. But we've been having a housing crisis um, for some time now. And COVID, by the time this is all over, it's a travesty in and of itself. It's a genocide in and of itself. It, the economic damage, a lot of these businesses are not reopening. It's going to cause massive bad changes to the economy, more people sinking into the proletariat, more petty bourgeois, middle class people falling into the proletariat because their businesses couldn't stay open because of COVID, as well as, I mean, there was an oil price war going on. There was all kinds of shit happening. So I think we need to look a little bit um, bigger here than Trump. Anyway, um, constantly talks about the removal of term limits. George Bush did this as well. Not as constantly, but he did it. Um, It's okay. So there's an article on Wikipedia called Professional Wrestling Terminology. What they are doing is playing the heel. It's good cop, bad cop. They're playing the heel. They're playing the villain. They know what, you know, uh, irks the libs and other people who have, you know, Uh, more of these like positive American values and they know how to play the villain to it. That's what they're doing. Go look up that article because it will help you understand politics and give you a vocabulary for it. Eight openly promotes conspiracy theories on political opponents. Okay. I mean, it's not good, but (laughs) Russiagate, Uh, most of Russiagate, even if you want to believe it, even if you think Trump's a bad guy, most of that shit has not held up. I hate to break it to you. Go listen to Aaron Mate, A-A-R-O-N space M-A-T-E. Um, I don't totally agree with Mate's politics, but he's been a tireless anti-Russia gate crusader. Um, all right, anyway, promotes far right and fascist perspectives. I'd say so do the Dems. They're just swifter. You know, they're a little slicker in the way that they do it. Uh, 10 threatens free speech and media transparency. Yeah. Yes. I mean, okay. Um, but Bill Clinton 25 years ago actually destroyed free speech and media transparency by deregulating media. So now there's like three companies that own over 90% of the radio stations in America, which is worse, which is worse. That was a Democrat that did that, you know? You got to think bigger here. You got to think bigger and lies constantly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause Biden fucking doesn't. All right. Um, just get this shit out of my face. These are such, these are, these are like democratic party talking points. All right. B we're thankfully done with the evidence there. Furthermore, he represents a severe threat to the potential for leftist organizing. One promotes violence against and murder of BLM protesters working to make anti-fascism literally illegal, more willing to deploy unmarked federal stormtroopers, diverts activist attention away from capitalism towards his own faults. Okay, starting backwards there, that's a huge leap. You're crediting Trump with a lot, saying that he is like deliberately pointing it towards his own faults. Uh, yeah, I just, that that's that's, I mean, Like I said, he's playing the heel, but the system wants him to play the heel. 
So I don't know. I, I would actually argue that does it's as helpful as it is, you know, harmful because when Obama was in power, what actually happened? Liberals went to sleep. They were like, oh, it's in good hands because they believed Obama's feel good bullshit. So that's just as much of a threat. Um, and also, I don't think that Biden has like. I think he would be more similar to Trump, actually, than Obama in that sense. Like, Biden is a fucking senile, like, douchebag. So, anyway, I just, I don't see how that's a big change. More willing to deploy unmarked federal stormtroopers. I don't think you can make a case for that. Um, I really don't. Because George W. Bush started a relatively unprecedented in modern U.S. history number of initiatives collectively known as the global war on terror, which included um, the creation of one John Poindexter, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, this creation of a hitherto non-existent police state apparatus that came in during the George W. Bush years. Have the Democrats dismantled it? Fuck no, they haven't. If they were like actually significantly different than the Republicans, they would have been trying to dismantle that whole Bush era police state that, in fact, they have just expanded. Obama expanded that police state. Then you get AOC running on we need to abolish ICE. The Democrats are shitting on her. So tell me again how the Democrats are less federal police state enthusiasts. If we had a Democrat in power right now, how do you know that they wouldn't also be deploying unmarked federal stormtroopers? Show me that. You can't. The thing is, we're 40 years into neoliberalism now. They're turning the screws every year. No matter who's in office, they're turning the screws every year. We have not actually had a period in the last 40 years where the screws were untightened. So trying to say that Trump is more willing to deploy them, well, we didn't have a massive uprising. In fact, we did have uh, an uprising not as massive and not as violent. I mean, violent, destructive to private property. But, you know, it wasn't as unruly. Occupy was during the Obama years. And Obama absolutely was not friendly to Occupy in much the same way. However, the situation wasn't as escalated. The screws weren't in as tight. We weren't as deep into the ongoing financial crisis from 2008 that never got, you know, turned around, eliminated, stopped, halted, de-escalated, whatever you want to call it. We're in that same economic crisis, just like with COVID, we're in the second wave of the 2008 crisis right now, because that crash we never recovered from, and now we're having a second outbreak or escalation of it. So don't fucking tell me that the Democrats are less likely to have federal crackdowns on protests related to general left-wing complaints like the foreclosure crisis or the student debt crisis or the medical care crisis, whatever. Obama absolutely was. So that's just fucking bullshit. Um, you know, and I guess the thing is here, I don't think Vosh is just mistaken. I don't think that people who make these arguments are just mistaken. I think they're working for the Democrats. And if you are a leftist listening to these people, stop. They are not credible. And they are trying actively to mislead you, to keep propping up the capitalist class, to keep changing the guard of the capitalist class so that each party has time to let the American public's very short memory reset itself And they can just try to just get another four years to keep milking us, keep milking us, keep milking us. That's what you're doing by buying into this utter fucking nonsense. Okay. Two, working to make anti-fascism literally illegal. Bush already laid all the groundwork for that. The Democrats did not undo it, nor are they seriously opposing this. You think Democrats like anti-fascists? Wake up. Again, was Obama friendly to Occupy? No. And that was way tamer than what's going on right now. We did not have the same kind of Antifa versus KKK street battles that have been, you know, going on more recently. I was starting to see that kind of Antifa um, activism starting in like 2016, maybe. Um 15, I don't even know if it was 15, but 
prior to that, it just wasn't going on and anywhere near the same level. So the situation has escalated and you can't say how Democrats would be reacting. I think they'd be, my guess is they'd be reacting the same way, which is a safe bet because Democrats usually do react the same way as Republicans. Okay. Lastly, promotes violence against and murder of BLM protesters. Well, I hate to tell you this, but this is the entire Republican party. Okay. It's not just Trump. Um, They have passed laws in a few states making it legal to do that. This is not a good thing. Um, Do I think that Trump is encouraging to these people? Yes. Do I think that they're going to go away if he gets out of power? No. They're still going to be doing all this. Look at all the right-wing shootings that there were, the mass shootings that there were during the Obama years. There were like more mass shootings than like ever. There was like one every day. So, you know... I, I'm not not at all swayed by this. So this article, and I got like a page left of this. It's this weird mishmash of Biden. Like this main point seemed to be Biden is the lesser evil. And then also Marxist Leninists want you to vote for um, bourgeois vote in bourgeois elections, which they want you to believe is synonymous with vote for a bourgeois party, which it most definitely isn't, as we have discussed. Actually, I'm going to reverse that. So the main thrust of this article is a Marxist Leninists want you to vote in bourgeois elections, parentheses for bourgeois parties. And then if we can't convince you of that, then we'll bring out all this lesser evil shit. Okay. All right. Point C here in section six, I believe we're still on. Trump represents a clear and present. Oh, God, that's so cringy clear and present threat of fascism while theorists maintain the importance of waging war against bourgeois democracy. I don't understand that sentence. I mean, I get that Trump represents a clear and present threat of fascism. I don't disagree with that, but I don't think Trump represents a singular clear and present threat of fascism. I think that the Democrats do just with a velvet glove on top of it. That's not hyperbole either. I wish it weren't the case. Okay. Not saying this to, like, make myself feel better. This is a fucking terrible situation. But I think it's worse to have illusions about a terrible situation because it's dangerous. We are in danger right now. And having illusions while you're in danger is really not a good thing. Okay, so point one, we now go into a very lengthy quote from Mao from on coalition government. Quote, if any communist or communist sympathizer talks about socialism and communism, but fails to fight for this objective, if he belittles this bourgeois democratic revolution, relaxes or slows down ever so slightly and shows the least disloyalty and coolness or is reluctant to shed his blood or give his life for it, then wittingly or unwittingly, such a person is betraying socialism and communism to a greater or lesser extent and is certainly not a politically conscious and staunch fighter for communism. It is a law of Marxism that socialism can be attained only via the stage of democracy. And in China, the fight for democracy is a protracted one. It would be a sheer illusion to try to build a socialist society on the ruins of the colonial, semi-colonial, and semi-feudal order without a united new democratic state, without the development of the state sector of the new democratic economy, of the private capitalist and the cooperative sectors, and of a national scientific and mass culture, i.e. a new democratic culture, and without the liberation and the development of the individuality of hundreds of millions of people. In short, without a thoroughgoing bourgeois democratic revolution of a new type, led by the Communist Party. Some people fail to understand why. So far from fearing capitalism, communists should advocate its development in certain given conditions. Our answer is simple. The substitution of a certain degree of capitalist development for the oppression of foreign imperialism and domestic feudalism is not only an advance, but an unavoidable process. It benefits the proletariat as well as the bourgeoisie and the former perhaps more. It is not domestic capitalism, but foreign imperialism and domestic feudalism, which are superfluous in China today. Indeed, we have too little of capitalism. Right here, if you think that that was persuasive in terms of Vosh's vote for Biden argument, boy, are you not going to enjoy the next 10 minutes. Holy shit. So that quote is what happens 
when people who don't understand the first fucking thing about Marxism try to use Marxist theory to bolster liberal talking points. Let's break this down. I'm going to start halfway through. A bourgeois democratic revolution of a new type led by the Communist Party. Where was Mao organizing and writing from? From early, like the first, <laughs> the 30s and 40s, like pre-World War II China. What was China's condition then in terms of its economic development and its mode of production? It was like still feudalist. What he is saying here, and I have to back up a step because Vosch, in quoting this, clearly does not understand his historical materialism at all, which whether you agree with it or not, to use it at all, you at least have to understand it. And I think he clearly doesn't. So for any of the listeners who don't understand historical materialism, Marx and Engels, in what they called scientific socialism, as distinct from utopian socialism, was basically a theory that um, not just that capitalism was bad, because, and Engels did a whole um, book about this called Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific, in which he says, like, in the early 1800s, there were uprisings against early capitalism, but they were really just kind of moralistic or idealistic in terms of their character. They were basically just, uh, well, they were what he characterized as utopian meaning that we need a new society, but they couldn't really, and that, you know, we need to get away from capitalism. And they were right about some of the things that were wrong with capitalism. It was bad for workers, it was exploitative, etc. But the limitations of the early utopian socialists, according to Engels, is that from a philosophical point of view, they were idealists rather than materialists. What does this mean? It, uh, th this was like a major thing for Marx and Engels. Um, idealism is a branch of philosophy that basically holds that the world of thoughts and ideas is primary and that uh, the material world comes second. Materialism basically says that material conditions shape things uh, and that thoughts and ideas follow and are shaped by those. So, um, in other words, you know, this uh, follows that the Marxist materialist concept of society and of socialism is that ideology and religion and other ideas within a society are products of that society's ways that it produces resources and organizes itself for material survival. And that basically all of the ideology and all of the ideology that is manufactured by the ruling class and all of the thoughts that you know, occur to the people who live in those conditions are all shaped by and are a product of and in some way serve that society. Otherwise, you just wouldn't be thinking them because, you know, they they wouldn't help you survive in that scenario. And that's really just what we're wired for. OK, so the utopian socialists were able to uh, criticize capitalism, but they couldn't say why capitalism existed or like how how we could change conditions so that socialism would be possible, all right? Just said, you know, we could rearrange some things or whatever. What Marx and Engels said is that when um, material conditions, meaning the, the, the means of production, the technology that we use to produce the things that we need to survive and feel good and happy, change, at a certain point, um, a new society becomes possible. So... They were all about development of productive forces and developing technology to overcome natural scarcity so as to enable a change from capitalism to socialism because they felt that the more that that technology got developed, it would sharpen in the minds of the working people in the society that capitalism really was like a thing of the past, that capitalism could no longer, uh, that the, the ruling class under capitalism, the capitalists, had basically created a world through their investments in this technology that had really outgrown their rulership and that a new society was needed and that the more that the material productivity was developed, society would eventually have to reorganize around it. 
Now, what's happened in a lot of the world is capitalists have been trying to hold people back for their own private profit, because as long as they stay in power, they live like gods. I mean, they live better than kings now, uh, you know, with billions and trillions of dollars. Uh, so even though this society doesn't work for most people and we definitely have the, uh, material abundance to provide for everyone, capitalists are still holding us back. Okay. But that's the case today in 2020. Was it the case in 1930s and 1940s China? No, because they were barely capitalists. They didn't have the development yet. You still see in countries that have Marxist Leninist governments like Vietnam and Laos, um, they're struggling to develop their industry and they've had to even take money from Western capital firms because the Soviet Union got destroyed and they can't get aid from them anymore. But the idea is that to have socialism, you've got to really build things up. And what Marx said, um, I think this is right in the manifesto, actually. It's certainly in many of his other uh, writings. It's like a core theory. Historical materialism holds that we've gone through several like eras in terms of production. There was what they called for tens of thousands of years, a hunter gatherer society, which they called primitive communism, where people lived off the land. There really was minimal technology. It was like stone age technology. And um, you just kind of lived like in balance with nature, but also kind of at nature's mercy. Okay. Then we get agriculture. We start to depart um, from that primitive communist hunter-gatherer society, and we get what Marx called the Asiatic um, type of society. It was a new kind of development that was, you know, early civilizations based around agriculture, but you had the emergence of like royalty and things like that. Um, then you get a slave society, then you get feudalism, but that the reason from the materialist, historical materialist, Marxist point of view, the reason why you know, people advanced from the slave society to feudalism was not a moral idea. It was because there were changes in property. There were changes in the way that people produced the goods and services that made society run. And there were corresponding changes in the social order around those things that perpetuated that material order and made it possible for it to continue. So uh, it holds for Marxists that in order to get to socialism, you have to go through capitalism. Now, what some of these countries did and what Mao is, at Mao is advocating here is that you get a Marxist-Leninist party in power. And um, even if your country is still like peasantry and not very urbanized or anything like that, you guide the country under Marxist-Leninist leadership through capitalism as quickly as possible. You keep the bourgeoisie on a tight rein. You run state capitalism where you can so that you don't build up the bourgeoisie as a class. Um, in other words, you do that development in, in as controlled a way as possible. The bourgeoisie doesn't do that development so that they can move on to socialism. They do it for their own private gain. And in fact, if you ever try to take it away from them, they will fight you tooth and nail. They will shoot you in the face rather than saying, yes, society has moved past the point where my class should exist. I mean, that happens in, you know, one out of a hundred cases, you get some radical bourgeois, but it's not common. OK, so that's what Mao is saying here. Now, let's compare to the United States, which is what we're talking about. I hope that was clear. If not, rewind it. Maybe it'll be clear. The United States never had a feudal period. Because it started in the 1700s when, you know, which was post-industrial revolution, the steam engine and all that stuff. We never had like a landed gentry and nobility. It started out as a colony in the 1600s and early 1700s. But really, by the time America became in, you know, the United States became an independent country in the late 18th century, who was the ruling class? It was the bourgeoisie. It wasn't wasn't uh, feudal nobility. So we the United States already was in capitalism as of the 1770s you know, largely. I mean, there was still a lot of agriculture going on. It wasn't all industrial, but you know what I'm saying? Anyway, um, so to get up to try to compare China in the 1930s and 40s in terms of their mode of production to the United States, which was on the absolute bleeding edge of technology in the 1930s and 40s, is ridiculous. So 
Mao is not a capitalist. That's not what he's saying. To a Marxist, they want the development of from, you know, feudalism is a pretty like backwards, low technology type of thing. Go watch Lord of the Rings. OK, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, in order to go through that whole period where you develop the factories, that's typically run by a bourgeois uh, class. And then eventually, once it gets built up to a certain point, you have the abundance and you have the development of the workforce and the proletariat that can actually run the society and uh, take power through a proletarian revolution. This is entirely irrelevant to the United States. Is that's, that's the, you know, I ran through all that background on historical materialism only to show you. This is what happens when Vosh, somebody who clearly does not understand Marxism, tries to use Marxism to own the Marxists. So congratulations, you played yourself again. So that quote was in support of Trump represents a clear and present threat of fascism, while theorists maintain the importance of waging war against bourgeois democracy. This is garbage, gobbledygook. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's citing Mao like so haphazardly this is not in support of his point but really what evidence in this entire document is in support of his point he's just he's such a hack he's he's so not credible <laughs> you want theory theory can offer you a lot materialist historical materialism marxism is it right a hundred percent of the time about specifics not always okay some of the first socialist revolutions were not in the very advanced countries of Western Europe, like some thought, like Marx predicted, happened in Russia, where that was more mixed capitalist and peasant. That's why there's the hammer, hammer and sickle on the USSR flag. It represents the alliance between the proletariat, industrial workers, the hammer, and the sickle, which represents the peasantry, who are not proletarians. But they were able to start building socialism in that country through guided development, through a kind of state capitalism that would build the country up to a point to make a really working class rather than a totally backward peasantry. Hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, keep listening till it does, because that is the concept. Anyway, so, you know, coming back to the quote before we go into the second one here, um, trying to say here that. The Mao is arguing for the new democratic economy of the private capitalist and the cooperative sectors. He wants China to get more developed because it, according to Marx's theory, will get them closer to communism. Does that make sense? Like, are you following that? Because that that is the theory. Um, you can't go right from feudalism to socialism, according to Marx. You need to develop material productive capacity and create the proletariat. So why is Vosh citing this? I think because he just doesn't understand what the hell he's talking about. And also talking here about, so do we need a capitalist revolution in the United States? As I pointed out, that happened like 250 years ago in the United States. This is completely irrelevant. And then when Mao says the substitution of a certain degree of capitalist development for the oppression of foreign imperialism is the United States beset with foreign imperialists right now? Did anyone proofread this at all? Come on. And domestic feudalism? Like, what are we talking about? All right. On to quote two. I just feel like I want to keep talking about this video is already over two hours long. But like, it's like I want to keep talking about that because I feel like there's just more absurdity to untangle. But... I have other things to do today, eventually. So, quote two. This is from Engels, Principles of Communism. Principles of Communism, by the way, you can find on the Socialism for All channel. It's more or less like the immediate precursor to the manifesto of the Communist Party. But um, anyway, in Germany, finally, the decisive struggle now on the order of the day is that between the bourgeoisie and the absolute monarchy. Yeah, so that's not comparable to the United States, okay? Since the communists cannot enter upon the decisive struggle between themselves and the bourgeoisie until the bourgeoisie is in power, it follows that it is in the interest of the communists to help the bourgeoisie to power. As, okay, well, they're already in power in the United States. You don't have to help them to power. They're already in power. In fact, they have two major parties they control. 
You don't have to help them to power. They're already in power at every level of government. Jesus Christ. Since the, okay, but, 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 it follows that it is in the interest of the communists to help the bourgeoisie to power as soon as possible in order the sooner to be able to overthrow it. Well, they're already in power. Engels was writing this in the 19, or sorry, 1840s. He was writing it 180 years ago at a completely different stage of capitalism when there was still a feudal order that had significant power that the bourgeoisie was fighting against. And Engels, again, just like I highlighted in the section about Mao just a minute ago, Engels in 1840-something was saying, uh, we need to, you know, in order to accelerate the progress towards socialism, we need to help the bourgeoisie stamp out the feudalists, then we will stamp out the bourgeoisie. Well, that already happened. It's 2020. We're talking about the United States, not Germany. The United States never had a monarchy, etc. And again, if Vosch understood the first thing about Marxism, he would not be trying to make the points he would he's making, and he definitely wouldn't be trying to cite Engels to make the point of vote for Joe Biden. Okay, I just I, I could do this all day. I mean, and and I I almost have, but it this can't be said enough. There's nothing to this. This is like. You know, you were shooting for a target in Oklahoma and you hit one of the moons of Mars. I mean, it just it's completely off, completely not even close, millions of miles away. OK. Continuing the quote, um, since the communists cannot enter upon the decisive struggle between themselves and the bourgeoisie until the bourgeoisie is in power again, it already is. It follows that it is in the interest of the communists to help the bourgeoisie to power as soon as possible in order the sooner to be able to overthrow it. Against the governments, therefore, the communists must continually support the radical liberal party, taking care to avoid the self-deceptions of the bourgeoisie and not fall for the enticing promises of benefits which a victory for the bourgeoisie would allegedly bring to the proletariat. Aha! So I said, I think correctly, that Vosch is doing two things in this document, trying and utterly failing to use Marx, Engels, and Lenin to get you to vote for Joe Biden. And where that fails, which it uniformly does, he's trying to make a lesser evil argument. Well, that's what Lenin or Engels just said not to do. You must support, again, back in the 18, you know, mid eight, uh, 19th century here, uh, continually support the radical liberal party taking care to avoid the self-deceptions of the bourgeoisie and not fall for the enticing promises of benefits which a victory for the bourgeoisie would allegedly bring to the proletariat yet that's what Vosch is trying to get to you get you to do with this whole biden's better than trump and blah 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 that's exactly what he's doing all right continuing with the quote the sole advantages which the proletariat would derive from a bourgeois victory would consist one in various concessions which would facilitate the unification of, a pro of the proletariat into a closely knit, battle-worthy and organized class. Again, this will not happen with Biden because what Engels is talking about is a class against a class to create another class, the proletariat. He's talking about class A, the bourgeoisie, fighting class B, the feudal nobility, in order to bring about capitalism, to create the proletariat, because the proletariat, the dispossessed working class under capitalism, is the only class capable of initiating socialism, according to Marxist theory, because it is in their interest, our interest as proletarians, to put everything in the common good because we've been deprived of all private property, because it's been concentrated into so few hands in the bourgeoisie that the rest of us have nothing. Therefore, the only thing to do is just take it away from the bourgeoisie and hold it in common as common property, thereby doing away with private property, private industry. I mean, meaning private industry, not personal property, but private productive property would be eradicated. Uh, private industrial property, that is. And eventually you could get rid of money um, along the same lines by developing this for long enough. Okay. So what Engels is talking about is not a faction of the bourgeoisie against another faction of the bourgeois bourgeoisie. 
It's talking about the bourgeoisie against the feudal nobility or monarchy. That's not what's going on in this election. Trump or Biden doesn't, re- they both represent the bourgeoisie. So you're not fighting class against class here. It's not the same thing. Only someone who has no idea what they're talking about would try to make this argument. Okay. And two, the other advantages that the proletariat would derive from a bourgeois victory. Again, the bourgeoisie wins either way. Biden gets in, Trump gets in, the bourgeoisie wins. Two, the certainty that on the very day the absolute monarchies fall, the struggle between bourgeoisie and proletariat will start. Well, that already started long ago. So this is totally irrelevant to the 2020 U.S. presidential election. Okay, do you understand that? From that day on, the policy of the communists will be the same as it is now in the countries where the bourgeoisie is already in power. Again, this was written like 175 years ago. It's not, uh, it's not relevant to this stage of capitalism. Engels is talking about the stage of capitalism when capitalism was still fighting with feudalism. That is long fucking gone in the United States in 2020. Not relevant. Bourgeoisie is already in power Vosh is literally telling you to vote for one bourgeois faction over another. That is not supported at all by this. All right. And then the last quote, I think we're almost done here, is uh, a Marx quote. Oh, no, 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 no. Sorry, this is not Marx. This is Duncan Hallis. What? Writing in a book called Marx, Engels, and the Vote in 1983 in Socialist Review. Oh, I guess that's an article. Quote, we are for the defense of bourgeois democracy, more precisely, more precisely, the defense of democratic rights against attacks from the right. Uh, I have never heard of Duncan Hellas before today. I was listening to the Hakim video on Vosh on this very subject. Apparently, Duncan Hellas, who I've again never heard of ever, is like from uh, like a, a spinoff sect from Trotskyism. Trotskyism already is an ultra left cult. Um, I think Trotsky did some good things earlier in his life. And then uh, the whole conflict with Stalin and the ultra left cult that arose. There are some fucking weird Trotsky cults. And they're unfortunately very prominent in the West, which I can only assume is assisted and facilitated and encouraged by the Western intelligence agencies. But um, so you have some trot talking about defense of bourgeois democracy that you couldn't find somebody other than Duncan Hallis to make that point. This is not one of the theoretical masters of Marxism, okay? So we're going to discard that. I don't even know who, who. For this random article from 1983. Good choice, Vosh. Good choice. All right. D, it follows then that con- the conditions for socialists' rise to power are better within a functional dem- democracy than they are under an autocracy. No, (laughs) no, that's a leap you just made and you're redefining these terms. He's trying to say that, wow, sorry, my head just exploded. He's trying to equate the Trump autocracy with the old feudal nobility, which was a completely different stage of global economic development as just autocracy. So this is, these are things a lib does who just doesn't understand Marxism even remotely. This dude calls himself a socialist. Yeah, he's not one. I think I've just given you like two and a half hours of evidence to that point. Wow, that's mind blowing. Okay. It follows then that, con- that the conditions for socialists rise to power are better within a functional democracy than they are under an autocracy, and we must fight to preserve said democracy and prevent the rise of fascism. Wrong, wrong, wrong. That is such a leap. If you don't see why, go listen to the whole section about the progression of the modes of production. See how it does not apply to the current situation at all. We are firmly, firmly, firmly in capitalism in the United States. It follows, yeah, okay, I read that part. And then the, the piece of evidence for this, remember the failure of the KDP, which was the German Communist Party around the time of the Nazis, which did not distinguish between fascism and social fasc- fascism and paid a dear price for it. Yeah, so that's the exact same argument that Chomsky made that I 
was calling out at the beginning of this video. I've done an entire separate video on that. I, I, I just I think someone in the Democratic Party wrote this shit for these people to put out there and try to like browbeat leftists into voting for them. So I said it before. I'll say it again briefly so we can wrap this up. But the German Communist Party refused to unite with the Social Democrats, who they called social fascists. And it badly split that part of the left. Yeah, except that's not what's going on in the United States. Joe Biden is not a social Democrat. The social Democrats are represented by Bernie Sanders. And I'm willing to work with Bernie Sanders. I don't like Bernie Sanders, but I'm willing to work with him. I think that communists and socialists have something to gain by working with AOC, Sanders, DSA, etc. We're not the same as them, but I think we should work with them while maintaining our distinct identity as Marxists. I think we should work with them because we don't have the numbers right now to do otherwise. And I think that they are enough of a different ideology from the two neoliberal party, well, three neoliberal parties and counting the Libertarian Party. In fact, I think Bernie's main failure was not to break away from the Democrats, who clear, which, you know, I'm sure he had some agreement with them on that. I don't think that's just 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 bad judgment. Uh, although I've done a video on that, too, how he didn't, he didn't want to get Ralph Nadered. He wanted to still uh, be welcome places, you know, and not uh, not split off from the Dems, which anyway, that's you know, the story. Um, but yeah, so this is more misrepresentation from Vosh that the German Communist Party wouldn't work with the Social Democrats, which led to the rise of Hitler. That's not completely what happened because. Anyway, Hitler's rise to power is more complicated than that. Um, but uh, in any case, I'm a socialist, communist, Marxist. I'm willing to work with Bernie Sanders. The, I'm not willing to work with Joe Biden, who is not a social Democrat. So again, this piece of evidence doesn't hold up. We have two right-wing parties. I think that that really confuses some people. But the Republicans are right-wing. The Democrats are right-wing. Bernie Sanders is an independent who is a social Democrat who is distinctly different in ideology from the neoliberal Dems. Yet, rather than going to the... Could be a very good party uh, to host a socialist, communist, and social Democrat coalition. Rather than doing that, which is, in my opinion, the obvious choice for AOC and Bernie Sanders to go to the Green Party and then build a left and social Democrat coalition to challenge the two right, well, three right wing parties. He's not doing that, which is really confusing people. So it's like there's this sort of train of thought of like that, that they, the neoliberals, want you to believe, which is that, well, Bernie Sanders is air quotes, in the Democratic Party, therefore the Democratic Party are social Democrats. Joe Biden, therefore, is a social Democrat. I mean, and Bernie, of course, was pulling this bullshit of endorsing Joe Biden, saying he's going to be pro the most progressive since FDR or whatever. Yeah, no, he's not. He's already shit all over Medicare for all, etc. He's not going to do a damn thing for any working people. Uh, he works for the 1%. But because Bernie Sanders is like in there, the Democrats, when it suits them, like to come out and say, oh, look, we're social Democrats. Socialists should work with us, which is really the entire thesis of this whole thing. All right. So lastly, there's one more quote. And then mercifully, although I kind of enjoyed this, although I don't know if you're still enjoying listening to it after two and a half hours. Quote, this is from Lenin, uh, Left Wing Communism, Chapter 9, 1920. It is beyond doubt, however, and, and I should add, this quote just stands on its own. I guess this is just summing up everything. It's not tied to any particular arguments. It is beyond doubt, however, first, that in this question too, those who try to deduce the tactics of the revolutionary proletariat from principles such as the Communist Party must keep its doctrine pure and its independence of reformism inviolate. Its mission is to lead the way without stopping or turning by the direct road to the communist revolution will inevitably fall into error. Such principles are merely a repetition of the mistake made by the French Blancist communards who in 1874 repudiated all compromises and all intermediate stages. 
Second, it is beyond doubt that in this question too, as always, the task consists in learning to apply the general and basic principles of communism to the specific relations between classes and parties, to the specific features in the objective development towards communism, which are different in each country and which we must be able to discover, study, and predict. Well, I've got to say, end quote, Vosch has utterly failed to do the thing Lenin just insisted on. It is beyond doubt that you must look at the specific relations between classes and parties, the specific features in the objective development towards communism, that is from feudalism to capitalism to socialism to communism, although you know, communism and socialism are kind of interchangeable, although some sources say socialism is the lower stage. Anyway, which are different in each country, thanks, when we're citing Mao and Engels writing a very long time ago about very different situations and which we must be able to discover, study, and predict. Well, I hope I have shown you Vosh utterly fell on his face trying to do that because he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing and you shouldn't listen to him. And then I did it much better and you should listen to me and other people like me, like Comrade Danky Kang, like Hakim, like Bad Empanada, and like all the other people who are Marxists who are calling Vosh out on his bullshit which is exactly what this is. Unsub from Vosh, subscribe to S4A, subscribe to some of the people I mentioned, get out of this rad lib fucking like dead liberal de-radicalizing zone because that is what Vosh is. He's there to de-radicalize you. He's there to make you into a liberal who thinks that you're a radical. You will think then that there is nowhere left to go in your political development in terms of advancing your interests as a proletarian. Well, that is wrong. Vosh is there as a limited hangout to deceive you. And as long as you follow him, you are being misled. Not to mention that he is a serial sexual predator, which is a different story from his not knowing Marxism from like, you know, <laughs> he, he couldn't pick Marxism out of a lineup. Uh, and you can find Comrade Danky Kang's videos about Vosh being a serial sexual harasser. And then to just get super petty, hey, Vosh, 1995 called. It wants its haircut back. Thank you. This has been Socialism for All. Thanks to our current patrons, whose names are on the screen. Please support us. You can support us for as little as a dollar a month, all the way up to a couple hundred a month. Uh, we have four patrons right now. I've been doing this for a few months. The more financial support we get, the more time I can devote to this channel. That means uploading more Marxist theory as audiobooks, more commentary and discussions, and just generally helping to agitate, educate, and organize towards the socialist revolution that we need. The United States, as we covered in this video, has two strong bourgeois parties, with both of which are edging towards fascism, like open, bad repression of workers' organizations and workers' rights. It's getting really bad and really scary. But we got to build it. And I think <clears throat> if we keep it up, strong we could have that in 10 or 15 years 2030 i think we could have some really serious organization because it's already better than it was five or ten years ago but we got to keep pushing the more you fund me the more i can comfortably devote time to this i would love to do it full time you can help that happen you can also follow us facebook.com slash socialism for all remember to like share subscribe and comment all of that helps to boost this video and share it with your liberal friends thanks <laughs>